Good evening. Welcome to the October 24th Village Board Work Session. This meeting is now called to order. We'll begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. So, before we get into our very exciting agenda, I'd like to uh, open the floor for anyone who has announcements, calendar items. So I do have announcements. I have a statement first. So let me just pull it up. Okay. Okay. So I want to read the statement on the record first, and then I want to share some very exciting events for this weekend. So, um, this is my official. Am I on? Yep. Okay. This is my official statement in response to um, Mayor Victoria Garrity's allegation as to why Austin lost the state of New York's downtown revitalization initiative funding. Um, as stated in an article, um, Mayor Garrity posted an article um, via social media and also a letter to the editor. Um, and um, I just wanted to highlight something. I'm not going to read my whole statement. It's available for review. But um, essentially, the mayor stated that unfortunately, the current political climate in Austin sent a different message. When my opponent began publicly calling for a moratorium as a top priority for his vision for the future, the village lost any chance of being awarded. The DRI for 2018, which is $10 million, um, this slanderous and false statement raises so many questions. Um, I, along with the majority of the Board of Trustees, requested a discussion on a perspective of a moratorium after receiving much feedback from current and former school board members, as well as many residents and property owners who were concerned about the village's ability to handle more development and its additional impact to overcredit schools and to our roadways, our village services, and the list goes on. This was to learn whether or not the option was appropriate. Um, there were some other comments made that I'm not going to go into now, but what I want to say here is that the mayor's attempts to politicize such a public grant process and her alleged conversation with state appointed officials raises many questions. But it also raises the notion that if a municipality has elected officials who have differences of opinion and policy, that the state will not work with them. That's the question. Every New York State municipality, including many that have been awarded grants, in this particular program the past couple of years have an array of local political climates and differences. That is what makes the democratic process what it is. What were the conversations that the mayor had and with whom? Does the state approve of such tainting remarks regarding their program? The fact is, the village is not ready to handle such a grant and, and the responsibility based off, of, based off of our leadership and our personnel challenges the last five years. Um, which we'll go into tomorrow as I post it on my trustee page and on patch. The current political climate is led by current Mayor Victoria Garrity, the chair and spokesperson for all of us at work sessions, the village, and legislative sessions since 2015. Um, so I'll forward this to, this is um, an official village memo um, in my capacity that is going to be sent to everyone. Um, so I did speak to Deputy Mayor Codman and Trustee Baysmore, and I do um, um, ask the manager and corporation council to help us draft a formal letter to uh, Megan Taylor, the director of the Mid-Hudson Regional Economic Development Council, as long as, um, in addition to Alfonso David, counsel to the governor, and in addition to the governor's personnel um, officer, looking into allegations as to whether um, local politics played a role in our disqualification of such a public grant. Um, going forward, I also need to be involved um, and or the board um, on any debriefs that is had between the mayor and the state. Um, now that the process has been tainted with politics, um, we need to understand what is being told on behalf of the board um, and also how that affects us going forward. Um, so um, I know that I had the consensus of Trustee Bazemore, because I called him personally earlier, and Deputy Mayor Codman, um, that we use official village letterhead um, for a letter being drafted to the state in all those appointed and official capacities, um, and um, us also requesting um, that at least two of us, in addition to Corporation Council, be present at any future debriefs with that council. Um, in addition, the letter would be CC'd to all members of that 
Mid-Hudson Regional Economic Development Council, um, which is quite a list. So um, we just have to make sure that they're carbon copied on that. Um, but that's my statement that kind of opened the floor up to my colleagues and the mayor um, to respond if they, if they choose to. Um, but um, I'll share my events after, I guess. Thank you. Any announcements? OK, well, I will uh, begin with my announcements, which is to remind everybody to please join us tomorrow at the Essex Public Library. Uh, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for securing the location and inviting folks to attend the Candidates Forum. This year it will be hosted by the League of Women Voters, which is the first time we've had uh, this sort of arrangement for a Candidates Forum. If you are interested in submitting a question for any of the candidates for state or local office that will be participating, uh, please arrive a little early while the program starts at 7. Uh, they recommend that you arrive by 645. And if you would like to submit a question, it must be for a, a race that you are able to vote in yourself. So if you live in the unincorporated town, you may submit a question for, say, the assembly race, but not for the village mayor's race, for example. And then I certainly hope everyone will get out and vote, if you can, on November 6th. Uh, do not assume that the outcome of the election is a foregone conclusion. Um, do not assume that the outcome of the election is a foregone conclusion. Everyone remember the 2016 presidential election? Get out and vote. Bring a family member, bring a friend, bring a neighbor. And uh, I would also like to update folks on a meeting that took place yesterday right here in this room, um, the Safe Housing Community Partners. Um, thank you to uh, the village manager and her office for inviting um, agencies from across Austin to help us uh, to be able to do uh, a better job at communicating and reaching out to the public when it comes to safe housing. It was an opportunity for the village to uh, share information about our process um, and our obligation and what happens with code enforcement. Um, but what was probably most valuable was that everyone who was in the room got to uh, bring information about what, what they bring to the table. Uh, and we were very pleased to have three members of the Landlord-Tenant Relations Council here. Uh, one of their um, priorities has been to provide information to um, to the community about tenants' rights and uh, how they can get help if they have a concern with their landlord. Um, but one concern is just creating a resource and having it sit on a website stagnant isn't going to be terribly helpful. So rather than um, just putting the information out there, we wanted to be able to work with community agencies that have a different relationship with tenants and residents in the community. And uh, it was uh, what was most enlightening for me was the, the variety of avenues that are available um, through the open door, through their patient advocacy work, as well as um, their educational outreach to patients and families. Um, Neighbors Link was here, and they brought up um, one of their concerns, which is addressing the um, culture of fear among tenants. If they, um, part of the, the big goal would be to empower tenants to know what their rights are, what they can demand of their landlord, and uh, what the process is uh, to be able to help them. So it was a very valuable um, valuable meeting, and uh, I look forward to the future uh, meetings. IFCA was present, and we were very pleased that IFCA has agreed to be uh, the recipient of information from everyone at the table, and uh, we will be coming back for the next session on November 27th to see where we are with creating those resources and creating the pathways to get those out. Do you have a question? Yes. Was uh, was anyone from the county there present? Or was just local? The, the, the county was not able to attend, okay. but they have been um, they have been reached out to. Karen had notified them that we were going to do this, so they do have some interest because, um, and Karen was able to provide some information to um, everyone who was here about the county's obligation because there's been some misinformation um, about who can have access to emergency shelter, and everyone can. It doesn't matter what your status is single family, um, everyone is uh, is entitled to temporary shelter through the county. And that was that was one of the um, the differences, uh, different pieces of information than what we were told a few years ago when we really started embarking on this relationship with the county. Okay. Thank you. Debbie, before I go on, did you want to comment on the Safe Housing Community Partners meeting? Um, I, I thought it was a really great meeting. Um, as, a, as an opening, and uh, thank you for the idea of, of putting that together. Um, 
as we embark on code enforcement and the potential for impacting our families and families' lives through code enforcement, uh, we had a discussion uh, on, on the need to actually put a committee together that could be a first response uh, in the case of an emergency. Um, and if, let's say, something happened in a building and tenants needed to be relocated, we should have um, a first response team that could come together with the resources, you know, be there for people. Um, it's, you know, when it's a very trying time for them and it's a very nerve wracking for them, Sometimes it's great to have an advocate by your side that can help you get the housing and shelter and get you where you need to be and, and take care of your family. So, um, and it was great to have the schools there as well because a lot of things that happen in our community affect the families that have children and, and that are in our schools. So thank you. I thought it was a good first step and I think there'll be a lot more coming. Um, a lot of people were very, very excited about coming together um, and putting this team together. So do you have a summary of the meeting for those of us who are unable to attend? Um, I don't, but I do have the minutes, uh -huh. so I can type that up and get it to everybody. <coughs> um, so besides, I'm actually very happy that Mayor Garrity alluded that, um, you know, if shelter is needed in Westchester, it's available to all. Um, which, but is there, is the, conver has the convers, I wasn't there, so has, is the conversation, if your home is shut down for whatever reason or you need shelter, I mean, because this conversation is coming off of we're going to start enforcing our codes better and we're going to start making homes safer, right? So is right now, and maybe it is, but I'm kind of just thinking out loud, is our only way to help them to send them to a shelter? And Wait. you don't have to answer that, by the way. It's kind of just like, is that like what our role is going to be with our partners um, to just say, go to the county shelter, they'll accept you? And the answer to that is no. And the reason we wanted to pull this team together is because we wanted local people helping local people yeah. in our families however they needed to be helped. But we wanted to pull the resources together so all of us would have the knowledge, the facts, and uh, how those resources can be utilized. And then however uh, a family in need gets to any one of us, then we, we know how to pull the team together to help them. So that's uh, okay. So because you answered uh, Omar's question, do we have actual places for people to go to in the case of code enforcement? Like when you said, because he asked, are they automatically going to go to a shelter? So if that's not the case, it would seem that we have, you know, ready available sites. So is, was that a part of the conversation? So this was a very high level first discussion about how we can find out what is available. So I don't know what the first response would be. I don't know if the shelter is the right place to go. I don't know if it's other partnerships. It was really a high level, not a detail oriented discussion, but it was a discussion on where are people going to live if they're displaced for their homes for whatever reason and what type of resources will they need and how do we get those and help those people through that experience. Okay. It was high level, no details at that point. It, it's important to understand, though, that we were talking about um, really two paths. And the first one is probably where we can be the most effective and help the most people, which is prevention of people being in unsafe housing conditions. That's helping families identify when their conditions are unsafe and helping them learn uh, what they're uh, entitled to and how they can help improve their living situation. It's everybody, you know, like one of the examples that was used was Open Door does a good job at um, educating families about nutrition. Um, so it, it's very easy for them to make the point that it's, it's not good nutrition for your children to have juice in a baby bottle. Um, having similar kinds of uh, education about the concerns of mold or the concerns of air quality, the concerns of um, Bugs, yeah, actually, bug, bed bugs came up a few times. That actually is a concern that, and, and cockroaches that came up as, as, as housing conditions that, um, that are unsafe for families. And for <coughs> families, uh, and the rights that you have as a tenant, uh, you don't have to have a lease, you have a key. And there, a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth between members of the Landlord Tenant Relation Council who really um, are eager to be able to get that kind of information out. And IFCA was, um, was obviously a good resource for that. So the, it's really two paths. One is how can we help people 
be educated about what is a safe, healthy home for your family and how can you uh, work to improve uh, the quality of the home that you're living in. And then if you're faced with the, the crisis of being displaced, what resources are out there? And so there, it's two paths. Okay, I don't want to belabor this conversation. I mean, I, I, now I have more questions. But um, in your notes, if you could, um, because you were there, um, just list, I understand what's high level, but when we talk about tenant rights um, and, and how they can improve their housing conditions, um, that would be an interesting point within your notes, too. Hopefully you guys talked about that at length. We, we didn't. Okay. And, and that's what I'm saying, the high level. Okay. We said we need to have something that says, what are tenant rights? We need to have something that says, what are the landlord's rights? We need to be able to educate people about what their rights are. Um, okay. And, and so that was the level of the discussion, and that's what you would see in the notes. Okay. Um, so there are resources out there, brochures that are already available. And Karen at IFCA has agreed to collect everything that's already there, mm -hmm. and then we'll sit and see what's missing. And then we can talk about how we can educate our population and through Open Door, through Neighbors Link, through you know the library. There's going to be various ways that we can educate them, but then also, as the mayor said, having an emergency response team available. And one of the major reasons for working with partners is that is that culture of fear that so many people experience in our community that was raised by um, Neighbors Link. Um, obviously, people are going to hear information differently if it's coming from um, the village government versus if it's coming from their healthcare provider or from Neighbors Link or from the schools. And so um, a big part of this effort is to find a variety of avenues for communication so that people can get the information in a way that they can really hear it and feel um, safe and confident that they can move forward with it. So um, I don't want to turn this into a political debate, um, but I will just uh, comment on the fact that uh, every year after a grant is not received, we have an opportunity to reach out to the state and ask for a debriefing. And I know that we are intending to do that for this year. I know it's on the list of things to get done now. Um, and I think it would be great if uh, at least a couple of us were able to be part of that and ask questions and understand it. Uh, planning and land use has been a priority of mine throughout my tenure, uh, not just as mayor, but when I was trustee as well. And I attend meetings regularly, uh, not just about the grant process, but about land use and planning. Um, and through that, I have an opportunity to speak with many leaders in economic development in both the public and the private sector. Uh, when it comes to grants like this, they, um, the state actually provides us with trainings that we can attend. Um, and I have attended trainings for the DRI. I have had meetings with uh, consultants who work with municipalities during the DRI application process. And I have spoken with the leaders uh, at the Regional Economic Development Council. And there are a number of things that they look for in a community and in an application. And one of them is a stable elected government that is interested in economic development. Uh, we had an, a meeting right here in this room not so long ago with our planner. And uh, one of the things we did start talking about was a moratorium. And I said at that time uh, that it is a word that is very charged. And it is something that people have a strong reaction to. To developers, it sends a strong message that perhaps this isn't a community that's interested in them to invest in here. To folks who are concerned about uh, crowded schools or crowded roadways, it may sound like it would be a great benefit. And uh, we had some back and forth with the planner and with members of the board. Um, and I think it was uh, very clear that uh, it is a strategy that may at some point be applicable in a very narrow manner. And uh, by bringing it up at this point, we sent a message that we are interested in obstructing uh, development um, rather than uh, actually working together with the community to come up with a better comprehensive plan that addresses a wide range of community needs. And I am looking forward to working with uh, members of the school district um, in the, and the town uh, and the community on reopening our comprehensive plan. We said we were going to do, do it for a long time. We intended to do it for this year, and I hope we are able to do it in the coming year. I hope that um, everyone on the board is supportive of doing that in 2019. It will certainly mean uh, uh, having a budget allotment for that process, uh, and I think it would be of great benefit uh, to the whole community to have a 
start by having a clear vision of who do we want to be for the next 5, 10, 20 years. All right. Mayor, actually, I couldn't agree with your last part, that we actually do need a clear vision of who we want to be. Um, you, we all know some of the challenges that we've had over the years, particularly with our personnel. Um, we know that um, we, have, we have yet to have a conversation of who we want to be. We have been talking about a comprehensive plan since 2016, since, at least since I got here. Um, so I guess the issue that I have is, is that, and, I, and I, it wasn't my intention to, to get so political tonight, but I read your, your article. You, you clearly said that such comments, uh, bringing a more, talking about a moratorium, was the reason that we didn't get the grant. When me and you both know that the city of New Rochelle, respectfully, has been, they've been doing a master plan, they have gone through the EIS, we've all, members of this board have said that we are interested in possibly doing that kind of uh, planning. And so, rightfully so, if I'm on the council, upstate and I'm looking at what kind of resources the community has put towards development. That's why they, that's why they got the grant. But to say that uh, a sitting trustee um, saying the word moratorium is a reason that we didn't get the grant, I think it's just not factual. And I think it's, it's a bit of a stretch. Well, I think you are focusing on one particular statement because I opened up with a rather lengthy, for the length of the article, description of the uh, really impressive work that has been done in New Rochelle with their um, focus on uh, streamlining their economic development uh, process and uh, latching on to uh, one statement where I said, any chance that we might have had at that point ended with a term uh, that is uh, very charged and sends a strong message to economic development folks. Um, when I speak with folks who uh, are involved in economic development, their feeling about uh, moratoriums is what I have expressed. I don't think we should continue to have a political debate for the entire evening. It is now after 8 o'clock. You may have one more comment, uh, well, but let's move forward. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, the great thing about public office and a municipality that has a weak mayor, former government, is that we each have one equal vote and we can each have our own capacity. And yes, the goal is to work as a team because that's how municipalities run most efficiently, but also most effectively. Um, you know, we've had throughout, really since um, I started, I, because I can't speak for other boards, um, really a challenge, at least I can speak for the majority of the board, um, that consensus is not subjective. And um, I think going forward, we're really gonna have to vet statements that are made on behalf of the entire board because I don't think they reflect mine. They clearly don't reflect Quantel's. They clearly don't reflect Deputy Mayor Codman, your Deputy Mayor. Um, and that's a little dangerous. Um, I worked for the state. I know how the process works very well. Um, and I know that um, your comment or your opinion, um, the main reason why I had to bring it up in public was because, you know, people want to know, Omar, why is your mayor accusing you for losing $10 million for me in Austin? You know? Um, and then I said, you know, it's an election year, it's political grandstanding, you know, um, it's two weeks prior to the election, of course, she's going to say that in an article today, you know. Um, when in reality, um, you know, as we've, we've had um, personnel changes and internal challenges that the state knows about for years, um, we know that we have a lot of internal departmental challenges. Um, and given the whole ETPA fiasco, even though we passed it, people know how that was handled under this administration and um, how, um, how we work with getting consensus from the community when it comes to housing and transparency and advocacy and um, a legislative agenda. So the village already has a perception of um, not necessarily working best with all of its community members and not necessarily um, having equitable consensus and conversations. So that's something that um, maybe the word moratorium um, sparked, but um, that just added to the mountains of our challenges that we have going forward. Um, that's why I brought it up, because it was a clear allegation that I had to bring up in public. Um, and yes, we're going to go to Beams, so thank you for your patience tonight. But I really had to clear that up. Um, but going forward, um, I do want that letter to go um, to everyone that I said earlier. 
Um, you will get a memo tomorrow. I want, you know, this sets a very dangerous precedent. You know, this means that if you're in the municipality in Westchester County or the Mid-Hudson region, and um, you could point out one area of local politics or your definition of political climate that um, you're saying that they're in danger of not getting state aid or not being um, not being judged properly. New Rochelle has a political climate. <laughs> Um, you can just Google the news the past two weeks. Um, so, you know, every local government, when you have different parties, different opinions, different people, different experiences, um, you're going to have differences. You're going to have constructive or, as you say, spirited conversations. You're going to have moments where you choose to disagree, but you come to a consensus that everyone actually agrees with. Um, but I am a little concerned going forward um, that if that's true, then, then, then I need to speak to the state or we can invite them here as to what political climate means, if that's going to impede us from getting state funding. So that's what I will say. Okay. You started that statement saying enough political grandstanding, and I agree. Let's move on. Madam Manager. Uh, thank you. Um, so today we are very excited to invite uh, Karen LaRocca Fells, who is the Public Library Executive Director, and Alice Joslow, who is part of Austin and Communities That Care, to talk to us a little bit about the program uh, that the Village Board agreed to fund last year. It's a year long program, and they have a great report to share with you today. So I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you. And how do I follow? So while, sure, so while the power, up oh, there it is. I'm Karen LaRocca Fells. I'm the director of the Austin Public Library. I'm joined by Alice Jaslow, who is one of the library trustees and with Communities That Care. And I also need to acknowledge Francine Vernon, who has been with us from the start of when we tried to get this program up and running. BEAMS, which stands for Be Excellent at Middle School, was funded by the village for us. Thank you so much. At the beginning of this calendar year, roughly about April is when we started. Um, we had written for a youth bureau grant to fund this program. We did not get the grant, and the village then stepped up to help us out. Our vision for this program was to give seventh and eighth graders a chance to be engaged in meaningful and enriching activities after school and during the summer. We started the program in April. We started the after school part of it in close partnership with the school district. And then we had our summer session this summer. And we just started our fall. Oh, we're about halfway through our fall session right now. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing and show you a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, the program itself has been meeting three days a week, both during the school year and in the summer. We run it as six week sessions. And when we do it during the school year, we have some of the children bust from the middle school directly to the library. During the summer program, we didn't have the busing, but we, we were able to get them there at the middle of the day. When they get there, they get a snack, they get time to do their homework, and then after that, they are engaged in some sort of enriching and educational activity. The whole program itself runs about three hours. The summer program ran about four hours a day, and that was three days a week, too. Um, one of the, some of the things that the kids have um, benefited from is they get to be part of this program with kids who maybe they don't hang out with in school. And a lot of them are getting to know the library. A lot of the kids in the BEAMS program are kids who don't necessarily come to the library, and they've gotten to know us, and we've gotten to know them. So I want to show you a couple of the activities that they were engaged in in the spring and the summer. Uh, we had an engineering group come in and do engineering activities with the kids. They built a super slide and a basketball support. They did recycled art. And with the Risco Music School, they did some performance. They really had fun with that one, put on a skit. They learned how to draw cartoon characters and gaming characters. And we've been trying to do a lot of science activities with them. So they built a motorized Lego vehicle. Um, they made DIY Alka-Seltzer lava lamps. 
is really cool. And um, and we have competitions with them. So they had a cupcake war and a midge win it. And I will say here that the kids, um, we, we sort of talk to them about what sorts of activities they enjoy doing. And they like all sorts of things. They love to cook. So we, do, we have been doing a lot of cooking classes with them too. And we realized pretty quickly that they love to eat. And I, I think that's really what it is. Um, but they've had, they've had a really good time. Oh, and here are our cooking activities. They made solar ovens using pizza boxes. And they made s'mores which actually worked out pretty good. So the spring portion of the program, like I said, started in April, ran for six weeks. That was our pilot. And so we had fewer participants um, for that one. We started with 16 participants so that we could find our footing. And then for the summer program, we had 26 teens registered for the program. And our retention rate is actually pretty good. We ended with 24 teens completing the program. Um, for the fall session, we changed it up a little bit. We were finding that the way we had structured the spring and the summer sessions was very, very labor intensive. Um, we were trying very hard to stick with it within our budget, uh, with our personal costs, and the way we had the program structure was making that hard. So for the fall portion of the program, we physically moved the program up to the teen room in the library instead of having it at the lower level, which is where we started it out. We're busing uh, 15 kids from AMD, and the program itself is open to a total of 25 participants. So those 15 kids from AMD are definitely going to do the activities, and then they are joined by the children who simply come to the library. That's been working out really well. Um, it's had a number of effects we've seen. We've been, we're in our fourth week now of the fall session. Um, what it's doing is it's making the program more inclusive. It's not just those few kids who heard about the program and signed up for the program ahead of time. We're re we have those kids doing it and many more kids participating in it. And it's also become more of um, an introduction to the library. So the kids are actually in the teen room where the library materials are for them, where that's their space. And, they're, and it's becoming their home. So that's working out really well. Moving forward, we have our winter session coming up in January and our spring session coming up in eight, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in April. And that's um, where our funding brings us to. So since we started in the spring, we've had a total of 67 participants. They've done 48 different activities. That doesn't count the kids, uh, what the kids are working on now in the fall. During the summer, we were able to partner with the school district to have the summer lunch program, which was open to anybody but our Beams kids, that we made that part of our program. And then during the summer, we had um, an anonymous donor who was so excited about this program that he arranged for the kids to go on a trip on the Clearwater Hudson River Sloop, which was absolutely amazing. The things that we've been seeing coming out, coming out of this program are pretty interesting. Like I said, we're seeing kids who we weren't normally seeing in the library. This is kind of a new thing for them. And now we're seeing these kids come back to the library for other activities, not necessarily just the Beans activities. So they're becoming more engaged. When they're in the library, we're seeing that those kids who were our regular library kids aren't just going to hang out and play on the computers, but they're actually engaging in the other library programs that we have for them. And the response that we've gotten from the kids is really great. They, they love the activities that we plan for them. We give them lots of input so that we can make sure that we're doing things that they're interested in. The feedback that we're hearing from our parents is very, very positive. Um, as you know, the after-school recreation program goes through sixth grade, and we're not trying to compete with that. We're trying to augment the activities that are available to kids, and parents love the fact that they have something for the seventh and eighth graders that is enriching after school. Um, our, the parents have told us that their kids are asking to come to the library more often. And um, the parents are also happy. As part of our program, we have the kids do their homework. Parents are really happy about that. <laughs> so those are the things that we're seeing. Um, the funding will bring us through until May. After that, we're not sure what we're going to do. We were, we're very much hoping that the village is able to fund this program for another year. Alice, did you want to? Um, I mean, this, this all came about because um, a lot of discussions were had with a lot of different board members. Um, I'm looking at, at you guys. Yeah, and, um, you know, we all have the shared vision of creating the proverbial village to protect children. And um, the initial um, 
grant application was so that we could augment the existing programming at the rec. There wasn't room for the kids to be at the rec after school because you're full up with up to sixth grade. So then we said, okay, so let's extend the vision of recreation and bring the program to the library. The unintended great consequences have been that we're providing another safe place for kids from three to six. Um, I know three of you have seen the movie Resilience, um, right? Um, and we're happy, by the way, to screen it for you guys if you want. Um, but the whole issue of adverse childhood experiences and protecting kids, you know, three to six are really critical hours. And seventh and eighth graders are not necessarily, though legally they can be out on their own, you know, we know that sometimes they may not make the best choices, right? So we're trying to create positive experiences in a place where kids can come and bond with people and hang out. And that's what's happened is the kids who were not, didn't have a place to sort of go and hang are now coming to us. So I think that that's an extension of the recreation sort of safe vision for the kids who are expanding it into the library. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled. I mean, I think that this is a perfect example of creating a proverbial village and protecting kids. And seventh and eighth graders are very vulnerable. And it's just great to know that they're in a safe place, bonding with a healthy organization, you know, and expanding their horizons. And I couldn't, when we met with Mrs. Vernon, I always call her Francine, yep. everyone calls her Mrs. Vernon, so I'll call her Mrs. Vernon here. Um, when we met this summer to debrief, and they came up with a concept of moving it from downstairs to upstairs, that was like, why didn't we think of that initially? You know, that was like brilliant, because now even more kids can participate, because whatever program we're doing in the, in the teen room is extending to kids who aren't in the program, so it's great. So thank you. Thank we couldn't you. be more thrilled. And in terms of going forward, we don't know what's um, going to happen in terms of um, the county grants. Um, I have been, t they originally were going to reissue the RFP this fall, but they decided not to. So my impression is that there's not going to be another RFP until September of 2019. So, you know, we're very hopeful that perhaps you would consider partnering with us again. Yes. Okay. So thank you for getting to the, uh, the money part of the question there, uh, Alice, uh, and for summing up so well. Um, really when the village board decided to include this in the 2018 budget, we didn't know if it was going to be um, enhancing a grant that you might get from the county right. uh, to make it a more robust program or if this would be the entire funding. And it ended up, this was the funding for the program and you've stretched it really far to give a whole year of programming um, to these groups of kids. Um, and uh, for us on the board, it's not just a numbers question for this particular program, although obviously that is the budgetary question for us. It's a policy question, and what we said last year, and what I, I, I think you have borne out as was a good decision, is that uh, we have a big picture goal of wanting to do great things for us and youth, to keep them safe, to give them positive places to be, uh, and that is investing in our community, and it's investing in spending less in making up for kids who, who didn't have those opportunities. And, and I think that philosophically the Village Board is very supportive of that and that was, that was the mindset that we went into um, this program with. At least, um, at least that was my thinking and I think, I think others share that thinking that we have a big picture goal of wanting well, and, to support youth. I have, you know, I had spoken with you, Quantel, yeah. and Omar. I mean, all three of you were you know, sort of involved as we yes. went forward as a shared vision. So for this year it sounds like um, there is not a county grant that you're going to even be applying for. Um, I don't know if there are other similar grants that you've looked at, and or have, has there really nothing else? We're, for we're not aware students? of anything, and you have my word that we will, of course, apply in September 2019. Um, and it's my impression that our grant that we did submit was um, viewed very favorably, but unfortunately, didn't get funded. <laughs> in the last few days of decisions. So I think we have a decent shot. 
and I think we're going to, if, um, if we're fortunate enough to get funded again by the village, we'll then have a year and a half of um, showing outcomes, you know, demonstrating. So, but it's, it's very difficult to create the proverbial village for youth. And ex come on up, Mrs. Vernon. When uh, the application was put in with the county, what was very important for the county, even though we didn't get funded, is that you had municipal support. It was a major question that had to be addressed. So it wasn't just getting a letter from the board that said, this is a nice idea. We would love for you to fund the library to be able to do this. They wanted to see you had a partnership. And I think you know that in the grant world today, they look for partnerships whether it's on the state level, the county level, or any other private foundations and things that offer opportunities. So the remarks that you're hearing is we hope you're in for the long haul. The library has said it's in for the long haul. This is new for them. They have not had the diversity of the kind of experiences those kids are getting. And whether they get a county grant at some point, the number of children that can be served is dependent on the money that you have because it has to be staffed and you have to have funds to get outside people who have the skill set to provide good programming for the kids so that they're interested in being able to come. They're not, a, they're not required to come like they are as young children in school. So there are challenges, but it is really an opportunity, I think, to continue a very exciting partnership. And there may be areas down the road that you will see that the library and the village working together can enhance things that are going on, not always just for children. Thank you. I imagine members of the board have questions and comments on this? Uh, how much money was the original? I remember going through this when we voted last year. What's, what, what are we talking about as far as dollars? Oh. It has to be in front of the mic, sorry. It's not for us, it's for the folks at home. I know. Yeah. Um, the village gave us $45,000. And what was the grant? There was the a matching, grant that right? we were trying for was $45,000 as well. Okay. But we did not get that. Right, so it's 45000 to do with what you're describing. For the full year, yes. And you said 67, it's, it's 67 unique, or it's people also that repeated? There were a couple of repeaters in there, but they were mostly unique kids. Okay. And that was through the end, of the, the end of the summer. So, I mean, these programs are great, and STEAM is sort of the future. For at least, I would say, about a decade. Without it, kids are going to fall behind. Yes, absolutely. So, and I know in New York it became a law that you have to have art in there, but the truth is the real shortage in the economy um, is the first part, and if we don't do this, uh, with the school system that also has a fabulous program, it's, uh, it's sort of going to be very shameful. Right. Um, I'd like to actually make a request, if it's okay with you. So um, I'd actually like to meet some of the parents of the oh, kids. And the absolutely. kids, I'd like to actually meet them. Sure. And, um, and just sort of hear from them what they like and <laughs> don't like and, and what the program has done for them, because I'm assuming that three to six o'clock, having been a working mother my whole life, is deadly. It's a killer to try to find a place for the kids of those age. The younger kids people take care of, the older kids can do it more on their own, although I wish they wouldn't be on their own so much. But um, that age group is really where we lose. I think, Alice, you said that when you presented the first time. For you, it's always been on the personal mission of we lose kids right at that age group. Yeah. Bonding them to, it's protecting kids and bonding right. them to a healthy, place right. right so that they're supervised they don't really see they're supervised but they're so no, understood especially yeah. i mean i know some of those programs like the weight with the paper they're i mean we live by the hudson so all the bridges are actually that's a design for bridges so you're putting that village manager into the budget or you're thinking about it or yeah, yeah, this it's is in, the budget it's in there for your discussion when we get to the budget yes thank you and by the Thank way, you. you were the applicant. We we uh -huh. wrote the grant. Um, <laughs> right. But you, you were the applicant. Um, you know, so like 
you, the village, right. applied for the program right. because the library and the schools couldn't. And um, the schools are providing the transportation, the bus transportation. I mean, that was, you know, I'm part of it. Yeah, that, you know, that was, we worked that out at the last hour. Um, and that was really good. So I'm actually impressed with the um, range of activities that they managed to squeeze in. Um, I know it seems like a lot of money, but when you're um, supervising kids and stuff, it, it, it goes quickly. Um, and the people, the woman that they hired, um, M Melissa Victoria is her name. I always think of Victor Victoria, the movie. Um, <laughs> she is like the Pied Piper. You know, she is a, a new employee at the library, and she has really, like, represented in the teen room. And, you know, she's young, and the kids really bond to her, and it's just great. And just having all the kids in the teen room rather than having separate kids downstairs, it just didn't feel right, and it didn't work right. So we couldn't be more pleased. And um, the library itself, we're going through a space looking at our space as well so um you know with an eye towards hoping maybe to increase <laughs> the space for our teens because it's really important to to, to do that 671 dollars a child for the year is actually like as my mother would say bupkis to pay for a kid to be involved in science and math and engagement with their peers it's great. Right. I mean, if you if you um, see all the kids at middle school dismissal, you know, charging down the hill, you know, you kind of I always wonder like where are they going, right. yeah. you know, and and um, I, I'm grateful for safe places for kids yeah. to hang out if they're not going home. Others with questions and comments. Sure. Uh, thank you for all your hard work and coordination of the different entities, the library and school, and I, I think it's great that... Oh, John, you were part of it, too. You were actually at the meeting. He's yeah, I was, for yeah. I'm so sorry <laughs> about that. Oh, How sorry. quickly we forget. <laughs> oh, no. I am so sorry. He was actually at the RFP meeting. I apologize. No, that, that's okay. I, <laughs> I don't think you were there because I was not okay. there. So, oh. I voted, thank, though. Yeah. Th thank you for I that. Apologize. No, and please, please. I don't. Want, I don't want to be the center of this. It's really your program that's the center of this, uh, and that's what we need to really focus on. Um, you know, I, I'm. I was so pleased with the presentation. I think it's great. I think it's a really important thing. I think it's really an extension of our recreation department, even though it's really not. It is. It's exactly. It, what you know, it is. it's. This is really just an extension of the program there. Um, yeah, it doesn't take place there, but but the beautiful thing is that you've got a beautiful. A uh, place for the kids to be. You've got the the curriculum. You've got everything set up. Um, you know, I would certainly be in support of of funding this 100% for next year. Obviously, we need to show the county we've got a track record and we've got results, and that's part of investing the long term. So, you know, I, I would be very pleased to uh, to to tell you, give you my support tonight um, for continuing to fund the program. So, thank you for all you do. Sure. So, I'm actually. You know, when I first found out that the board um, did an RFP, you know, I think that right there was a proud moment where, you know, the, where Austin at the municipal level really said that, you know what, this is part of our role as well. So I so, you know, kudos to the board at that time for kind of starting the program. Um, I'm absolutely um, wholeheartedly 100% behind this project. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Alice, um, we're, we have a challenge, right? So we have a challenge currently at the rec center at the library when it comes to space and programming. Um, so it's great that uh, while we take the time, I know that our village manager and our new superintendent of parks and recreation department are working really hard to reconfigure the space and just, you know, some master planning and upgrades. And that will come, you know, as, as months go on and stuff. But um, I think it's great that, you know, we provide a, an opportunity that is free to students. Um, I think that's really, um, to me, it's huge because we know that the majority, more than half, I don't know what the new number is, of students of the Austin School District are um, below the poverty level. Um, so right there tells you that when it comes to any spending, any programs, any activities, the majority of Austin students can't afford it, right? So this is actually accessible for them to do so. The rec department, 
and um, and private um, providers in the village do offer additional programming, um, and that's great. Um, but um, it's it's a little expensive for some people. So um, I think that you know us us recognizing what's the easiest way right now is the first step to reach as many kids as we can as our first step. Um, you know, and I would like to have a conversation really as to um, regardless of the county application funding in 2019, since we don't have a youth bureau, um, you know, how can the school district and in the village and the library have like a 10 year plan to, to, to get to as close to our type of youth bureau? Um, the library is the only entity that's been really successful and actually has dedicated um, staff and programming and space to teens. Um, and the group of, of Austin residents that we're not reaching effectively um, is teens. Um, you know, um, and that's, that's, that's a whole different conversation, but thank you so much. It's our pleasure, believe me. I, I'm glad you raised the issue of a youth bureau because we do not have one and we did have many conversations. Francine and I have gone through two at least two um, directors of the West Chesty, West, what, what is it called? The, the, uh, the county one, oh, the West Chester County Youth Bureau. Like we've gone down twice to talk to directors about the possibility, but the, there are all these complicated formulas and designations and every time we're kind of discouraged about that. But we all really have a vision of protecting teens, and that's really where we want to move. Whether it's a youth bureau that is under the village, library, municipal kind of budgets, where we have program, comprehensive programming for youth, is really what we're the vision of where we want to get to, right? And seventh and eighth graders happen to be the most vulnerable. Nobody pays for babysitters for them, you know, and the kids who are just on their own, three to six, it's not always a good situation. So thank you so much. Yes, uh, so Karen, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the partnership. And to Ms. Jaslow and Ms. Vernon, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and Ms. Vernon, seriously, thank you. Because you are always pushing us to, to be mindful of our young people. Are always pushing us to say that there's, there's more that you can do, and and uh, and I really really thank you because when you push, then 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 we push, and and and, as, and and I have to say that this is a program that really um, definitely the board at the time, and and definitely my colleague now, um, I think you'll definitely see support, um, and I think we all share that collective vision when it comes to to young people, because um, I'm I'm. I'm I'm so happy about that presentation because it's it's the one time in, in government that we can really say that we're really investing in the lives of the people who live here. And we may not see it today, but that kind of programming. You like you never know what, what, what spark you can light. And and it's not you know, that may not be the thing that you can measure today. But I, I, I definitely believe that in the long haul, you know, there there's gonna be some young person was going to say, you know, that one day I went to the library and I made an oven, right? And, and the fact that it's more inclusive now, um, <coughs> those are the things we need. You know, those are the things that are missing. Um, and so I just want to thank you two for just constantly, constantly, constantly pushing. Uh, thank you, Trustee uh, Common, Deputy Mayor, for being those initial meetings and, and to uh, Mayor Garrity and, and, and Trustee Levin for definitely um, – you know, even though we didn't know whether we were going to get the money or not, to just say that it was okay because, you know, these are the moments. That was a tremendous leap of faith, and we cannot thank you enough. Seriously. The, these these are the moments. You know, these these presentations, these outcomes. So I just want to thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I think you get the sense of the board that we uh, appreciate your good works, and I'm glad to hear that it is included in um, the budget for us to be considering. Uh, because that's that's going to be a lot of our focus in the next several weeks. So it's 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 a good time for you to come in and give us this update. Yes, very pleased. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is budget items for considerations from the community, and that actually is 
it, there's there's two items on here that are kind of the same thing okay. because Asning Bucks ended up being sort of a larger conversation um, because one of the the questions the considerations is how do we want to put money in the budget for holiday lights and that whole display for next year we could maybe do it on a bigger scale that's a consideration but then um, you know every year we have a conversation about uh, what are we gonna, how are we going to try and draw shoppers to downtown. We've done different things in the past. We've done the, the bagging the meters. Last year we did Austin Bucks. And so this year there are really kind of three things for us to consider, Debbie. So Okay. Sure. I'm happy to combine two into one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're moving right through so much. And, and also we're skipping snow, too. So we're, we're, we're moving right through we this. We don't even want to think about <laughs> snow. Thank you very much. Um, well, those... Don't say the S word. <laughs> right. So I want to share a little bit of uh, the, the data from last year. If you remember, we, um, we embarked on this at the very last minute, right? Um, our contract with the chamber wasn't actually signed until the 19th of January, which was the end of the program, but it's okay. Um, we had, the board had allocated $7,500 and it was an offset of the parking meter revenues to be used to stimulate downtown growth. There were 47 businesses that took advantage of it. And I, I really think that was a good showing given the fact that we started it so late. Um, and it was, a, what was that number? 47. Except just downtown, really? It yeah. was all over. You could do it if you were. It was like anywhere the in the village of Ossining, right? And I, I have to give a lot of credit to the chamber because they really put together a team and went door to door to the businesses, uh, tried very hard to explain this new program. I think there was a little bit of reservation because people didn't really know what Ossining Bucks was going to be about. Um, there were a few that I spoke to that when I said, you're not losing anything, you're giving a credit to um, a customer and then we reimburse you that money at the end and they were like well I'm in that's that's kind of a no-brainer but there were still some reservations and I think that um, this year it will be a lot better received the people that were able to collect the Austining bucks and make that work for them uh, were reimbursed at the end I will tell you that the last report that I have from the chamber shows 170 Austining bucks were uh, <coughs> redeemed now, it doesn't sound like a lot, and it probably isn't, but given the fact there were only 47 businesses, and it really was like the last two weeks of shopping, um, and it was hard to get those, the, the bucks. Here's the, here's a picture of the bucks, if you want to remember. Um, I think it was just, it was a new idea, you know, a new concept. So I actually think it was pretty successful for a very short period of time. And I'm really hoping that the board is um, excited about doing it again um, because I think that it did stimulate some excitement downtown and that's really the whole idea. Um, I know that if we have more time, we can get this information out to more businesses and get more of them on board. We can actually talk about a different way to distribute the bucks um, because I think that too uh, has room for improvement. Uh, again, because it was the last couple of weeks, everyone was just kind of handing them out to their friends and they were distributing them at the farmer's market. Um, but I think we could do a better job of getting these into people's hands uh, throughout the community. Um, and um, so we had actually paid the chamber uh, $5,000 um, so that they could reimburse the uh, expenses. They had an expense for doing the printing. They had an expense for the design. There was an except. Uh, we had these, if you remember, these larger posters that went in people's windows and things. So there were some expenses. Um, I do have to confess that I met with the chamber, went over all of that. We gave them the money. They reimbursed um, all of the businesses that collected the box. And then I didn't follow up for a final. So I will do that um, next week when I meet with them. Um, but really, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to do this program again, because I think we have more time and we can kind of get it, keep it going. But they, what do you think? Pardon? Do they, the chamber? Oh, they're very excited about oh, okay. it. So they really do want to do it again. Um, and I think that we're all pretty excited about having more time to do it and more <laughs> opportunity to reach out to businesses and explain it and the public and do more publicity. I thought it was a good alternative that the board and the
random chamber thought of. I mean, um, I mean, personally, I would love to have a conversation later about, you know, bagging the meters and how it works in, in other places in Westchester with more enforcement and all that, right? But um, this is a new program that came out of it until we figure it out. And um, from what I hear, it was pretty good. I mean, I did have, I did see a couple of, um, of business owners that I don't think still got it even after the program. Right. So um, any way that we could help really sell the program. Um, and I'm also thinking if we're distributing it from the village perspective, what is something that we want residents to come here for? Is this an incentive for them to come here for? So I don't know. Um, I'm thinking right. out loud. But I like it. I mean, I, I it's for downtown revitalization kind of. So I'm, de I'm also contemplating as to whether I know that we took the money from the expense of bagging the meters, correct? Correct. It's right. actually the parking revenue. Okay. Parking revenue. So I'm thinking if like the monetary, if if possibly, it seems an appropriate project for the downtown economic development fund council to fund. Uh, it's right okay. up their alley. But but let me let me explain. Um, so I apologize for the interruption, but this isn't just for downtown. It's Austin Bucks. It's shop all local, the whole entire village. And even though we took it from parking revenue, which is in a very concentrated area, it was to benefit all of our businesses. Oh, yeah, and, um, and just lastly, um, I don't know the percentage, but um, hopefully when I get an intern in two months, well, that could be a project we could work on, but um, is I know that at least, and maybe I have to correct myself and redact my statement, like, two months, but um, at least over 40% of our businesses are Spanish speaking, mm -hmm. right? So maybe that's a barrier for understanding the program and what we're doing and okay. why we want them to take a coupon that, they're, they're, you know, it's right. just, I could see the confusion already right. and why most will just say no. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, just to add that. And that's like to it. two sides for the box. Right? Yeah. One right. in Spanish, so, one in English. Yeah. Right. Like in instructions or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think now that we're more in tuned with putting things in Spanish as well as English, um, that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay, so I would actually be in favor of continuing the program. Um, I kind of believe that this program kind of came out of a conversation in the budget meetings last year. Because yeah, idea. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think um, j just to be just to be mindful, I, I know there was one business in particular uh, for the for those businesses that have um, where it's like five dollars here, five dollars there. There seems to be a challenge because they, um, you know, it's a cash business. So, like, th them having to wait all the way to the end of the, you know, like a month later, mm -hmm. it, that becomes an issue when you, you know, when you're when you're dealing with like small amounts. Right. So that's some um, that's something that you guys might want to kind of work out as far as the reimbursement and how quickly one can be reimbursed. Uh, sorry. And, and if I could speak to that, um, you know, that was another one of our operational glitches mm -hmm. because. Um, it took a while to get collect the bucks mm -hmm. and to get it um, in order and then get um, a, a discussion with me and then get the check printed mm -hmm. by finance. We would do that a whole lot faster so that they could get it as soon, you know, pretty much as soon as it ends. So um, the chamber has a checkbook that they can just handwrite checks. Right? Okay. So it's not like the village writing each person a check, okay. which is why we chose to do it and giving the money to the chamber first. But now that we know what the process is, the chamber could walk into a business, say, how many do you have, and write them a check. And I think that would be much better. It was a glitch. Right. First year learning curve. Right. <laughs> I think it was to, there were a lot of issues that came from the chamber and the businesses about that whole idea of the two hour par free parking or the day parking and who was using it. it. It's just that there were very few people that were in support of continuing that. We looked for another solution and that we sort of talked must have been in November because that's when we it did was. the budget. So it sort of uh, came about. So, you know, I think this is simple. You know, I know when a, a bunch of the trustees were walking around with them to try to encourage, it was really hard for me to explain um, to people how it worked. It was people just like they see coupons. They're like, what do I have to fill out? Will I ever see them? Do I have to discount? It was really hard. So, I mean, that. I think it is better now because it's year two. I think we could just write you emails. I mean, I'll write you my experiences. You could ask uh, some of the local, whatever. I wanted to also um, 
I, I think it was good for the first year. I always think you try things for about three years and then right. go back. I just don't want to go back to the meters. I personally, and I think you and I, I mean, if I could take like a shovel and just get rid of them all, I would mm. do personally. But I really don't like the covering of the meters and the monitoring. I mean, it's it's all that. It's not. It, nobody wants it anymore. It's like not my opinion. It's just the people who it's supposed to benefit were saying they don't want it. Um, and you know that. And then there's a the financial issue to the taxpayers and what it costs and is it worth it and monitoring. So this is going to be benefits. Uh, this will be like the next generation of this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool. The artwork is already done. So you're not paying for the graphics. The printing right. is already set up. You have to add another language. Right. You have to explain it better. You know, all of that we should probably put on the website and maybe an explanation so people can at least go to it and all that. I mean, I, I think it's going to be much better, and I think it should not be a downtown project because I think we have a lot of businesses oh, yeah. elsewhere that, you know, are feeling left out. So I think this really needs to go to, um, and you know, I think the payments need to be a little bit quicker, and you'll do that. Oh, that's you why won't I'm saying. Wait. So I think that'll be fantastic. I'm like, I hope year two is double or triple um, yeah. the amount. Did you get anything besides the startup? Were there people that said, please don't ever do this again? I mean, no. or is it just frustration? I didn't get it. Nobody, uh, blah, 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 blah. It was more about when am I going to get re reimbursed? Okay. So and and cool. I, we've, we've figured that out. Okay. So that's really great. Right. Thanks. But we had people from Arcadian Shopping Center and uh, Highland Avenue and Main Street and Croton Avenue, uh, Spring Street, Camp Street. Woods Road, uh, Denny Street. Westerly, Pleasantville Road. So there was, I mean, it was kind of out there. I think the other thing that kind of happened was I didn't see these flyers. They're supposed to be in the windows. In the windows, yeah. because that was going to be the attraction. Like, that's like the co visual connection. <clears throat> um, and maybe these are too big. Yeah, and also, what I will. No, I think they they actually are exactly what you should have. And they're right. expensive to produce at that size. But right. to get bigger, it's worse. To put in people's windows they're exactly like right. i think that's the right idea them in their yeah yeah but, so they have to be asked to yes. do that and I also think like uh because i remember you know like when you give them out it's like well where can i use these i mean if there's a way that oh, we know yeah. the businesses beforehand and whether it's english or spanish on one side or, uh -huh. or double-sided but there's a list of participating businesses right. that will go along yeah, is there is is there something on the on the poster that says for a list of the of all businesses go to X website because everybody has a phone it in their did. pocket because that'll grow. We we did, but that's not on here. Okay, so and that it wasn't on here. So, so I would want to know that because it didn't occur to me the Laurelly Sports had it, and I really would have used some of my asking bucks there. Okay, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope they do it again this year. Right. <laughs> yes, I am but there way too much. Says, so look that would for be the Austin Buck sign in the window. <clears throat> Okay. So we'll so put, it, didn't on the put it in the window. Yeah. So no I think I think we need to have there. a page that because we know that's going to change. So we don't want to print that list because we. Yeah. And I'm sure the chamber. So I'm, I'm, to understand what is the the budget we're talking about, I I, I didn't write down the number well, you said. We paid year, the chamber. We paid the chamber how much for the administration? So last year we allocated seventy five hundred. Mm -hmm. It was twenty five hundred for um, operating expenses, printing, all that stuff. And then five thousand to be used for the coupons. We only wrote them a check for five thousand, and I think there's probably a little money left over that can roll into the you know what they already have. I, but we, I don't we gave that the, we gave the chamber a check for five thousand. They paid out five hundred and thirty-five dollars for the hundred and seven coupons that were plus their expenses, which I did, I don't have to this file for some reason. But wasn't the wasn't that the operational expenses? Wasn't that the twenty five hundred that we put in the budget? No, the twenty five hundred was for that, but I don't have those expenses in my file to t to say how much it was to print these. So, do they so owe we did. Us money or? Do they still have the money we gave them? They have to. They're not. They, they can't they use do. money. That's uh, because, th and that's what I said when I first started. I didn't follow up to settle up. Oh, okay. I thought that was just an information sharing. I didn't realize that was a money. money that was a money thing too. Retrieving. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> But I don't know yeah, that we it, need it to has add. To be there because it's right. So I guess I'm trying to figure out exactly what the cost of it was last year because we so some of that cost isn't going to increase very much. The printing cost isn't going to increase that much because we we had we printed more than we needed. The design is done and there's a right. So we're just gonna we're just gonna tweak that stuff so so that the actual operating cost isn't really going to increase and in some ways it might even be 
less expensive. Right. Um, we would hope that that 535 becomes a thousand or 1500 right. of coupons that are actually cashed right. in. So I guess I was trying to figure out what is the actual amount that we spent last year. And if we add a thousand to that, how much are we thinking that we are likely to spend this year? So after my meeting with the chamber, I can tell you that. Um, okay. So I think that if, if all of you are in favor of doing it again, then I can come back with the actual expenses and then you can decide how much you want to allocate for this year. So one of the things that um, occurred to me while we were sitting here is the way that we got these into people's hands is, you know, we just took a stack and went to the I farmer's know. market and started handing them out and told people to come by. The, um, it, but, it, and it was the first year, so mm -hmm. half of what we did was explain what it was. Right. Um, and people didn't know that it existed. They didn't know to come and ask for it. They didn't know, remember to take it and use it. But um, we also, we want everybody in our community to shop local, but we may want to actually advertise in some of the local papers, like take out an ad with, you know, all the holiday circulars in the Gazette or in the Examiner or something. I don't know what the cost of that would be for us, or but it might be, you know, if we're trying to draw people in here, how much is it? Which paper? Westchester Business Journal is about three thousand dollars. All right, we don't need to be that broad. <laughs> right, but we want regular old shoppers. If we do it electronically. It's probably a lot less. If we did, if yeah. We so let, do so I would say story. that's why I wanted to know what is the what is the actual budget for the program, and then can we add a marketing budget? Because I, I if if we're allotting seventy five hundred dollars, then we don't we're not we didn't even use half that last no, year. I don't exactly. think so. We could certainly invest. A certain amount of money to advertise mm -hmm. it to get more people to come into Austining or to stay in Austining, and uh, hopefully then have to pay out so, more. In but the challenge is how to get this in their hands. Okay, so right. An advertising budget, whether it's um, online, a digital ad, a banner, some, right. some, some, Facebook ads, whatever that will, right. will you know. And I don't the chamber and you guys can figure it out, but you know it's been very simple, you know. Just like cash, pick up here, or I don't know. Yeah. So you you want to? Right. I mean, look, I think that Gail knows and Johnny G know how to do this, right? They're yeah. gonna send it out to all their folks and say you do the, you sign up by X date and we'll put your name in some ads, whether it's a Facebook boost for whatever hundred bucks or a patch, and we'll put your names that it's available. But these are the things you have to do, and I think this year they'll get more people. They'll go to the ones that did it, and they'll go to the ones that didn't. If you don't make this deadline, your name doesn't get publicized for free as a part of of a program. So I think that's, um, I mean, I think that right there will help you. And the rest is, yeah, we walked around and, and gave it, I mean, everywhere I, I went shopping. But, you know, now that you've had the experience, just sit down with Gail and say, what's the best way to get it? The Arcadian, you know, go. I mean, I don't. I don't think any of us are saying we won't it's help this year. Yeah, like just yeah, imagine, you know, like, you know, like, cause that's the best. Like, yeah, for the yeah, farmers, stop the shop. Well, in the yeah, like, hey, you in know, the board or volunteer, well, I mean, shop, whatever right. it is. I mean, we have a tree lighting, a menorah lighting, or you know, oh yeah, and events, I hand them out on the sidelines of soccer so many, games. Yeah, yeah, you can give them out so anywhere. Many, but like, you know, so and so we didn't have them ready to finish yet because it was that late. But I I will say that from a business point of view, the idea is not for a business that when somebody's at the register to give them a five dollar discount and say you know happy holidays right. the idea is to help local businesses get more customers in the door and more people to come to Austin. so we do want to have some sort of parameters it's not like to stack up in your store and you give them out right. for people that were right. coming to anyway just delay your income no i mean it's, it's <laughs> supposed to bring more people in and if we could advertise it locally and have some folks come in and go oh, this is sort of a neat idea or anything that gives us a little branding i think would be really cool so uh, i mean five bucks it's like you know i'd do it it's pretty cool free money yeah. I did it. yeah okay thank you what's the other one so, so that's one, right? yes that's one of well, three so related topics for the holidays. Uh, holiday. So there's another proposal to uh, create a um, it's a musical display in Market Square, um, and there's an artist that would like to do that for us, oh. um, free of charge from a labor perspective. But got an email from you. It's um, like musical month. What is that? It's like it month month or has something? anybody seen it? Because he did it at his house, and he's done it elsewhere. It's pretty phenomenal and engaging and we we would actually be getting it at the commercial level and what i liked from the, the proposal is that he um in 
things is right. I would need steward and Debbie's ex expertise. It seems like we would get to keep the majority of the equipment. The village would get to keep it. Um, oh, because yeah. we'd be purchasing. Yeah, so right. that that right there is already a win. So even if we don't want him to operate it or much, which depends on what level we did it at. Right. It, it depends he, he on what did the original proposal yeah. at but, quite large. But that we could do a scaled down version maybe yeah, for the first year. For the first year, but that that right there could be an attraction that would just enhance any other events or programming during the holiday season. So when I talked to him, he wanted to do. Uh, we, we talked about incorporating a menorah and. Um, also being able to do something in Market Square, but then he was going to run it over to the tree and have the tree doing funky things as well. Yeah, he also mentioned uh, that. But that was for the higher level. So. Oh, really? Because he mentioned that. I don't that, remember like, the pricing for any of this. It's a ten grand, so right? Originally, it was eight thousand. Then it went to ten thousand, and and um, my comment to him was, you know, we do not have money in the budget for this. This is not something that we anticipated or thought about. Um, so if you can go out and get corporate sponsors, that would be great. I know he's reached out to several um, and it's been denied so far. Um, so I think he's coming back to see, you know, what your appetite is for doing something like that. But Mayor, you, you spoke to him about something much smaller. Uh, well, no, I just emailed him because we were having this conversation today. So I said, um, you know, we, this is bigger than what we usually allot. And I wasn't actually remembering that it was 7,500. For some reason, I had 5,000 in my I head. Had for, I had 10, yeah. No, 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 not from him, for our um, parking meter offset. So oh, in okay. my head, that 7, in, that, that's great, right? because I was thinking it was 5,000, so it's 7,500. Um, uh, and so I said, my question to him was, is there a scaled down version that could be considered for the first year? And he said, yes. And I gave $5,000 as the range. Um, I don't know what that would look like. Uh, I think the idea would be, it's not just that if you happen upon it, it looks cool. It's that it gets pushed out there as apparently, I mean, the show, right? The tree lights actually, yeah, it, it would be promoted. It would be, it would be promoted by beyond just us having to do the promotion as part of these holiday lights. Is music part of it? Mary Garrity? Oh, I just oh, said yeah, it. it is. It is, oh, right? He, well, I mean, he, uh, he sent us some links. I don't know if anybody remembers. I didn't that. see the you links. I just saw the, I, I didn't do oh. all that, but. Because like I saw it, but I mean I've seen his work before, but it just um, I um. I found it pretty mesmerizing. I I loved it, but I I like Christmas lights. I, you're a Christmas person. So. I mean, can we refer this for recommendation to the? I mean, I know that the Downtown Economic Redevelopment Fund Committee um well, allows denied. huh? They've denied it. Well, it well, denied. Uh, well it allows. I was just gonna say it allows for the board to make recommendations and also them to make you know recommendations in the charter. Ginsburg for the to, fund. We have to approve everything anyway. So yeah, so yeah. Um, um, I think a smaller scaled version is Mary Garrity, just to try it out. Um, I mean, 10 grand, I think, for the first year is just a lot. I don't know, just to me. Um, but um, just to let you guys know, all the snowflakes and the pea studs that you see throughout the village are three to $500. Um, you can actually ask Paul. Um, each. each yes oh. yes and and if, if you want to upgrade or get well, them that would be why they're so old yes <laughs> yes <laughs> so so this is restringing them so while we own them the lights uh, are led that go through it they and the fact that we restring it most municipalities have it strung out by company i mean we do really good when it comes Which to maintenance. number three on the list <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean i would i would love to somehow um see what a down uh, what a downsize plan would be at five grand if he's even open to that. And guess what? If he's not, he's not. Um, but um, it would give people, I mean, I could see it already, you know, um, an entire schedule where families can go out downtown um, and wait for the show to start. I mean, it's really, and it could be done over and over and over again, depending on how we plan it. Um, and I love that, that we get to keep the stuff usually. Um, I did event production. You, usually, we rent all the stuff and give it all back. So, um, you know, any and it, and it fits right into the whole, you know, into the, you know, into the mission of attracting tourism to Austin. Um, so, I like it. So, I'm not in support of um, this, and I'll tell you why. The box was a replacement for another cost. You know, I'm sorry, but like tons of stuff going on for the holiday. Every town has their own stuff. It's not going to attract anybody from anywhere. It's a nice to do. My preference is if it replaces what Paul is doing, if they have a conversation, Paul says, you know what? Show me what you got and what I get to keep. And he comes and makes a recommendation on the part of staff that says for next year, 
we're going to not do these snowflakes that whatever we're not going to do this and we're going to put place i'm all for it um i'm not for like yet another budget item um for the holidays there's a lot of stuff the menorah is probably not a kosher menorah anyway it's like a cute thing to do but there's a free one that the rabbi does anyway right so which is an actual if you're jewish actually has a meaning and this will actually not allow him to do um, that one if there's another one there. So I just think I'd like it to replace a budget item and I'd like our staff to look at it and say, this is great. You know, this for that, like what we just did with the box, that was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for that, I'm in total support. And even if it costs 10 grand, if we're now spending 12 and it's gonna cost 10, yay. You know, but I, I just don't want to keep adding. I mean, I don't mind for teens, but this to me is not something that will attract and do. But if Paul looks at it and says, we're going to save 20% over five years, or it's better than what we have at the same cost, X, Y, and Z. And then this person should actually, I forgot his name. I apologize. If he sees the video, he's going to go mad, but I did read it. Um, you know, it's also, I have this thing about going with an individual because right behind them are 15 more artists and 15 more event people that are going to say, and seven chamber um, members are going to say, why him and not me? Because this is not a non-for-profit. This is not, it's a different ball game for me. So replacing great staff recommendation with a real cost analysis over the next three to five years, yay. Uh, but just an added budget item uh, for a nice to do for me is is not that excited about it. So I, I have spoken to Paul about it, and I actually have his response here. Um, we started have... before I did my whole spiel here. <laughs> <laughs> going to stop me in the middle. It's not like the first time. It wasn't going to interrupt you. <laughs> um, so they they've already spent the money to replace the strings on the trees, and that's oh, all in the process that. of being done. Um, he says here, as far as the post-mounted stars and such, um, those are still in pretty good shape, and we will start hanging them next month. The rec department also decorates the lights. So he wasn't planning on buying any more this year, which was going to be our third um, third one. But again, you know, we'll put money in the budget to replace whatever we have to. Um, and he did but, but say the point was that he should placed. look at it today for future. So we, we don't keep replacing things if we know there's a something that we right. can bring in next year. But my question would be, do you really want the stars not to go up if there's a active display in Market Square? I kind of saw it as an, as an enhancement to what we already have. Um, and I personally didn't see it as a budget item, but I actually don't mind your idea. It kind of made me think of other ways. But um, um, that's why I, you know, the Downtown Economic Development Fund Council was created um, to fund, to, you know, all these types of projects, uh, whether it's tourism, whether it's branding, it allows for advertising. It allows for it's all in the in the contract of understanding. But um, it really allows for the board um, and the advisory committee members to fund projects. That ultimately, wouldn't ever make it to the public budget based on their recommendation, and they already turned it down. They looked at well, it, they analyzed it, they were not recommending it. That's the that's, that's why correct. she had said that. Right, but the. They're one of three parties, just to be clear. So the contract calls for um, the, the appointed committee members, um, the Chamber of Commerce, as, as listed, and then finally the Board of Trustees. Just, just to clarify how the process is supposed to work, it's in the contract. Um, um, but regardless. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't want to. But, um, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it's to work together to, you know, what is what are projects and opportunities that normally wouldn't be able to be funded at the municipal level because it may be outside of our role of operations and you know what I mean? So I can I can tell you that the reason that the Downtown Development Fund Council denied the request is because they are looking at a very limited pool of money that's remaining and they wanted to be able to invest that in significant long lasting. Uh, and they they saw this as a one time splash but not long lasting. And so they wanted to try to preserve the funding that they had left over. I spoke to the chamber today about their feeling on this. And they said that $10,000 was a lot of money for a one-time thing as well, and they would not recommend it. So those are just 
I, I, I just I do want to I just want to make clear. I, I think it's unfortunate that we didn't have a conversation with all the parties at the table at the same time right. because I think Jeff emailed a proposal and then wasn't part of the conversations after that because if if we're actually purchasing uh, the products, then it wouldn't be a one-time expense. We would be purchasing things that we would then have an ongoing expense to to be used, but the major expense would be the first year, and then we would be hiring somebody to then do the display in future years, right? So it's not it, it's not a one-time thing. We wouldn't bother spending $10,000 or $5,000 on something um, if it was going to be 10000 or 5000 the next year, right? Because wasn't that part of the proposal that we'd be buying the equipment? Wasn't that the, the greatest expense in the proposal? That's all the expense. Because Jeff was going to do the labor for free. Oh. So I have to be honest when I saw the proposal and I saw ten thousand dollars. You're not honest. <laughs> when I saw the proposal and I saw ten thousand dollars, I just <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I just I just didn't even. I, I said I. I didn't. I didn't even know if he was really real. And I was like, because we always get little emails, and I'm like, ah, ten thousand dollars. I don't know where this guy's coming from. Um, what would be help? <laughs> what would be helpful is um, for me, ten thousand dollars was a lot. So I was kind of like, uh, you know, where's this coming from? Is it the contingency fund? You know, this is like kind of last minute. Um, you know, like I don't know um, if there is a smaller version, um, and if we could see exactly what that looks like and, I, and I'll definitely go back and pay closer attention to this that particular email um, maybe but I, I definitely um, I can just tell you from the from the jump when I saw $10,000 I was like oh no nah. so I don't I don't know where the because I know Rick is like I don't know where the rest of the board is at but it's kind of hard to have this conversation right now even if there's a you know even if there's a $5,000 proposal like what does that look like right you know? I, th I think I think we all have that question yeah there is a five thousand dollar proposal. What does that look like? And then, where would the money for that be coming from if the down, if the economic development council isn't supportive of it? Um, John, you haven't re uh, chimed in. Do you have any questions or things you'd want to consider? I, I, if the chamber is not interested, and if the downtown development is interested, then I think you should kick the can down the road and get more time to really look at the thing. Yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't. I, I don't want to be rushed into it. I mean, I I, I wouldn't be in favor of. Doing it right now, we need a lot more information, and these are the types of things. It's like we're talking about the Austin Bucks. <clears throat> you know, th this is something that needs to be planned and promoted, and all these other things have to be. You know, if we're going to really get the benefit of it, so um, and it, you know, it, it's something that needs. If it's something that's going to be long term, it needs to be part of Paul's budget. You know, it needs to be part of like you know whatever ornaments the village does going forward. So uh, I would want to see him, see him be more involved. So I think there's enough interest. That uh, Which is rare. <laughs> <laughs> not actually rare. It just seems like it on television. Um, <clears throat> uh, and Quantel too. Um, that uh, we would like to have some more information about what a five thousand dollar proposal would look like, and um, I think it would be worth having a conversation so that um, that Jeff, it's Jeff Staples, is the name of the resident who has done this in the past. Um, and who made the proposal to us who's done it in his home. Um, and uh, then have him be part of a conversation with maybe the chamber, maybe, uh, I don't know what his conversation was with the Economic Develop Development Fund Council, if he just sent them an email or not. I don't know how much. Um, it, because we have questions, and, and we've all, you know, some of us have actually emailed with the proposal. I know Rika did, and, and, and we haven't had a lot of back and forth. So I think, what would $5,000 a project look like? And um, let's be either on the phone together or in a room together with um, with members of the chamber, members of the village, um, and with him to find out what, what we'll really be considering. And uh, that needs to happen quickly so that we're not feeling rushed. Um, and uh, if we're talking about $5,000, where is it coming from? Um, but speaking of holiday lights, that was the third thing. So we're talking about how are we going to bring people to downtown to support uh, our local businesses during the holiday season. Um, and I, I'm actually surprised that there's this much support for the Austin Bucks because it, it wasn't as successful last year as we had hoped it would be. So, um, but I understand the concept of wanting to give it a few years to build and to, to be more recognizable and, and um, have the potential for success. And you know, we'll see next year if it if it doubled in, in effectiveness, then then that's a good or tripled, then then 
maybe we're, we've got something here. Um, but I was surprised that I was surprised at how much support there was for that because I, I kind of thought it was uh, it was kind of disappointing last year. Um, but the third thing was our kind of sad looking at decorations that are a number of years old. And I, I remember, yeah, I think I was I was at uh, one of those um, conventions, and there was you know one of the many organizations that you know the vendors that sell those things. And I think I emailed Debbie then and said, "Can we please can we please do something better next year?" <laughs> um, and and now she uh, reminded us that uh, you had looked into that a little bit. Do you have any information on it, or uh, you just no make other your recommendation? than um, no? I mean, now you know how much they cost. Uh, we had put money in our budget uh, for. Uh, other you know for celebrations and buying that kind of stuff i don't know how much we had originally budgeted nineteen thousand for that but i don't know how nineteen much thousand dollars in the 2018 budget for what celebrations what what, is, what that's broad i'm yeah. assuming that's like flags yeah flags and all that stuff oh, okay. it's no it's uh so it's families it's in the recreation budget. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Family okay. Sunday, okay. Santa Claus gifts, yeah, Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas yeah. with Santa, Halloween, yeah, the, the family the, fun the, the, fair, egg, egg so, hunt, so, yeah, oh, all that like stuff. A yeah. real yeah. budget is a running, running I, budget. I don't have I don't have the current expenses. This is just my budget book, um, and there was, yeah. I I would just like to see, um, and I you know I I any way that we could. And kudos to Paul, because I've spoken to Paul about this for years. He's been mm -hmm. doing pretty good at making sure that our fixtures that we have have lasted this long. Oh, that, yeah, that I know. Oh, yeah. From cleaning them, to shaking them, to changing it from LED. Right. That I know. Um, if there's any way that we can, on our own, in-house, or within whatever's left, uh -huh. enhance what we have, or possibly, back to Trust 11's point, Bring it up towards the upper business district, Roosevelt Square area, oh. um, Camp Woods area. Now that we're going to be welcoming, well, you yeah. know, any way that we could. I'm not saying just you know, you know, yeah. complicated. Whatever is feasible in this amount of time that won't affect our budget, or I don't know, but just if we could look into that. When you say enhance, what do you mean by that? Um, is 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 there a public something in, in Roosevelt Square? That we could add a snowflake or a garland or universal winter holiday decoration oh, or something. Okay. Extended, extended yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking we were, we were talking about having a company come in and do lighting for us instead of our existing. Uh, that's a master plan, but I. All right. no, I mean, really. I, I mean, yeah. it's like vendors come in and we say, "Look, we've got you know, take a look. How many lights? You know, how many you know street lights do we have, and what do you have to offer?" and what does package A, B, and C look like, and what's the cost? And then, but then it's not our staff that's putting them up. It's them that's coming in and putting it up, taking it away. We don't store it. We don't maintain it. We pay a service every year, right? That's what mm -hmm. some communities do. Right. That's what's yes. We we don't. No, I know we don't. We, we are very labor intensive <laughs> here. That's right. So in the order of things, for uh -huh. me, um. Things have to replace something else. Mm -hmm. No additional budget. That's my preference. So when you look at it, I want the staff to give a recommendation about Jeff's stuff because it might be for next year. It might be something mm -hmm. um, to do, like set it up now, correct, so that we right. know what's happening. Show us what it would look like because it's, it's the end of October. I mean, right. next month, I like it's November. You know, we're back. Um, I would do it as a very high priority to fix less in downtown. And do more in Upper Croton up to. Okay. I mean, I really, it's um, not looking good. I don't know a nicer way to say that. It's a mm -hmm. nice way to say it. Um, Needs some love. Saying it well. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to be polite. Care. Needs love. Tender love and care. And, oh, <laughs> just, just a little. You. <laughs> um, you know, if Paul can, in his infinite wisdom, figure out every other tree with them streets which mm. improve the downtown so for me i don't need more christmas lights and i happen to love this time of the year by the way um i don't um, need every tree if we do every other tree but get it to go farther and if there might be people um i wrote you an email this morning from a number of conversations there might be a few people that might throw a few bucks in privately to help make that happen we should see if mm -hmm. they'll still do it but this is this this is doable Right, this is doable mm -hmm. to stretch it out, not just in the downtown, so that the whole corridor looks 
I don't think we can go all the way to the Arcadian, and I don't think we can go all the way to Chilmark, but I just think that one corridor is a good start. So those are sort of my order of preferences. More, not better necessarily. And you're just talking about the tree lights, though. Not talking good, about I'm, like I'm just, stars. For me, it's a good start, but I'd rather have you talk to our staff and say, "Hey guys, how do we or ladies or gentlemen, not ladies, how would you stretch mm -hmm. this out a little bit on the same budget? And what do we need to replace for next year? Because we have somebody who's a resident who could really do a whole new thing for us for the next three right. to five years." Um, I, I, okay. I do want to add is in this sort of a replace um, conversation, the um, Downtown Development um, Council is not doing the commuter um, piece, those discounts oh, for stores. Okay. So this is my theory about three years in testing things. Mm -hmm. So they, they tested it. It actually did okay, but the amount of work, it's not expensive. It's a couple hundred plus dollars. It's really, you know, for the public, it's when we put into the commuter, envelopes um, when we put discount tickets and we also put them in the library and all that um, discounts there's so many programs I think you know the school system has the cards with the 10% there's so many other programs there's it's too much work involved and I don't think the vendors got a big bang out of it so they've decided to sunset that and okay. focus as you said on bigger project but I just want to let people know that was not going to be happening I know Marianne is still not back but somebody should tell them that they're not, they do already know. Thank you so much. Uh, but I love the idea that you test things for three years. So you give things time and you say exactly what's going to happen at the end of three years. If this works, we go forward and we budget. And if it doesn't, let's be grown ups and say it's not working and let it go. And um, okay. okay, so I feel like um, I look forward to hearing back from your meeting with the chamber first to find out what was the actual cost of last year's costing bucks mm -hmm. and then even if we add you know a thousand bucks payout and we add uh, uh, marketing budget then what are we talking we still might only be talking about five thousand dollars for right, that or less. Less. yeah that would be great right um, uh, so then even if we were just working with a seventy five hundred dollar uh, investment you know set aside for what the parking meter mm -hmm. uh, revenue loss mm -hmm. um, it's fine to have an extra $2,500 in the general fund. I'm very, very okay with that. But um, if there's some other, um, how else would we want to spend that money to bring more shoppers in? Um, is there, is there something that makes sense for us to do to invest in more holiday lights or a, a different, um, whether it's something on the roadways and more of the roadways, or um, is it worth uh, getting some uh, preliminary estimates from a company to come in if we decide that it's not worth doing the maintenance and restoration of, you know, if we want to put to bed the existing uh, decorations that we have, the uh, snowflakes and such, and do some go in a different direction. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Always, always, always yeah. think it, see? Uh, <laughs> um, and then I think I think we want to find out from, from um, Jeff Staples what would be a five thousand um, dollar initiative. What will we get from that? And 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 have a real conversation with him. Mm -hmm. and all of that may not be able to be accomplished. I think you said you're meeting with the chamber next week. I don't know if all of those things. If you're going to discuss all of them with the chamber, if you want to, I will get. Okay, then I don't know if you want to have Jeff be part of that conversation. And who's who's our uh, liaison? Are you the liaison to the chamber? Are you, if 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 you are not able to go, then. Um, at least one of us well, might be able to go. Yeah. Downtown is not going to be. I mean, they've really set their strategy in place. Okay, so tell us when that meeting is, and and one or two of us will go. And, and I think Omar and I have the most flexible schedule. So, um, okay, uh, it is after nine o'clock. Let's take a quick break because we have uh, three more items here. I would, but uh, yes, do you? No, I mean, there's no. There's uh, you know, it's. Um, he doesn't have to be here, but I would be polite to him if he were here, but we usually save the quickies to the end. Okay. So that our, if we're brain dead, that's okay. Um, Are you trying to run out of here before we get I'm getting it. <laughs> it so is. So <laughs> clean vehicles. All right, so will I be out of here by 9.30? The, the, the contact for, for uh, clean vehicles is um, TBC. I don't know. Who. Yeah, that's, that's us. <laughs> so I didn't know if it was Rico or if it was Debbie. Could you what does TBC stand for? To be confirmed. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I didn't realize I would have confirmed. Yeah, I thought it was a typo, but okay. No, I usually acronyms. Okay. <laughs> acronyms. All right. Okay. TBC right. it is. So it's it's Please. really about our zero emission vehicles. Um, 
Trustee Levin sent an email saying, you know, what are we doing uh, in that regard for the village and environmental. There are rebates for zero emission vehicles um, available now from the state. Um, there is only $300,000 for the whole state what? allocated. But if What's you get, email? if you buy a vehicle that's somewhere between a 10 to 50 mile range, you can get $2,500 for a rebate. Or if you buy an electric range greater than 50 miles, you're eligible for 5,000. So it's a first come, first serve. Something. So I don't understand what that means. 10 to what? Your, the distance that your car will go before you have to have it recharged is anywhere from 10 to 50 miles. You get 2,500. There's different types of electric yeah, okay, vehicles. Okay, but, but what would be the 10 to 50 miles? Like, that's not much. Understood. Okay. But that's why I said what. You know, it, like, it depends. It's not going that far. Right. It, well, and it depends on the type of vehicle, what it's doing. Uh, you know, I did a little bit of research on them and. You know, the colder the weather, the shorter the battery life, and the more often you have to. So it's just two levels of rebates. Um, I did do some homework to find out how much these cars cost to see if that was even like a good rebate to get. And um, the Subaru, Subaru has an electric vehicle, 25,000, 26,000, Land Rover, 56, Infinity is 53,000. We're talking in the 50,000 range. I said, well, all right, what if we went with a hybrid? So we. But the Nissan Leaf is under 20 now. Yeah, but that's not an all electric sure vehicle. It is. It's a zero. It's one of the only actually zero, pure zero emission. That's what, I'm, is that's the leaf? what I got. It's part of that now, are we able right? to buy these through a state contract? That might be the issue. Nissan and Leaf. I don't know the answer to that. Oh, so I, the ones, the, the ones on your list are not necessarily from the state contract? Correct. Those are just correct. Retail. Um, so, but anyway, even the hybrids are anywhere from 30000 to 55000 to buy. So um, there was some research that I did online to see what the cost benefit is. You know, you save on gas, you save in your carbon footprint and things like that. Um, but depending, again, on the battery that's in included, the battery may need to be re replaced every five years, and they're very expensive. Uh, could be late longer, but... I mean, we've been driving for 15 years. I'll bring my husband and he'll do the whole lecture I, for I understand. You. I'm but just saying. I'm speaking if, from experience. If this is, this is something that we could apply for, um, I did go to an uh, electric vehicle show uh, that Westchester County put on, and they had five different models there. I got to look at all of them, and, and they looked, um, you know, they looked pretty amazing, actually. And I was thinking that we could start buying them for our code enforcement officers. The code enforcement is the one that gets uh, all the hand-me-down cars until they're, you know, you know, you're doing the, you know, you're stopping them with your <laughs> shoes and. <laughs> You're doing the Fred Flintstone yeah. thing, trying to get it started. Um, and, and, you know, we, I talked to Paul about being able to set up a bank, you know, charging stations, where we would put those, how that would go, and, you know, it could be our introduction into electric vehicles. Um, we did talk about a larger fleet as far as they do have police vehicles, they have fire vehicles, they have, you know, a lot of stuff. So I really wasn't sure um, so what your idea was when you asked. So my idea is this, that one of the things you guys do is look at your inventory when we do the budgets and you say what's coming due. So the replacement mm -hmm. for things, so electric is always more expensive in the short term. Right. Um, the battery story, we're still driving the Highlander, which is a Toyota has the hybrid technology, Nissan has a different, and Chevy has a totally different technology. They're all different technologies, and so it's hard to compare them all. Okay. Uh, the batteries aren't what they say. It is true that they're more expensive. but with rebates and all the other stuff, it, mm -hmm. it brings it down and down. Um, you never need gas on a pure zero emission. There are no oil changes. There's no oil. There's no engine, actually. So, you know, right. there's all the wear and tear that you don't have. But as John just pointed out, it matters what you do with the car, right? Mm -hmm. So you'd be amazed that most Americans don't actually drive more than 60 miles an hour round trip to the in their daily that they think they do but they really don't okay. um, and you can plug into a regular wall today you don't need a special charger they're just faster so my thought was again a replacement on the budget 
are there three cars coming up? Really, okay. does everybody have to have a Jeep that's fully loaded? And when I first started as a trustee, Quantel and I used to laugh about this, right? Do they all really need souped up, you know, four-wheel drive Jeeps? Like, mm -hmm. I know we're in a hilly area, but seriously, um, <laughs> you know, do we have to have the top of the line for everybody in every job that they have? Like in parks, if they have to go into our parks, do they really need like a thing that can go up a mountain at 45 degrees? No. So I right. really was hoping a replacement. Okay. Is there a way to look at what's coming down the line? Mm -hmm. What can we get rid of? You know, my feeling okay, is that I don't even think we should give everybody um, cars the way we do. That's a different conversation. That is a different conversation. Thank you for saying but, that. But <laughs> um, I don't think that we should be doing it in the first place. Okay. Um, and they all all of them and we drive through, you know we have these things the, we plug into a regular wall like you get a supercharger for like 400 it'll charge in a tenth of the time or a third of the time okay. or something but i don't i plug mm -hmm. it in at night the next day it's fine so for a lot of the people that we use um including it's better for the environment they're just better for everyone and you know i've had like really good luck with them and right. the idea that you can plug them anywhere means that you don't have to actually put charging stations all over them it would be nice i'm just saying you actually don't you have, have to have a plug they come with them you plug in no the i know wall. but on the outside i mean of the wall on the outside of the you have to have an outside plug yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you're gonna have to put in charging you stations you can drive it into a garage and no, seriously, you could plug it in anywhere. Like Engine I put cords a across Main Street. Window and plug it in. I go and stay at hotels and they plug it in outside for me. I don't think that'll pass I'm just, enforcement. But I'm just, I'm just saying it's really not that complicated. It's right. nice, though, to put charging stations, uh, but I'd like them to start replacing, sure. and I'd also like to understand why we keep giving people so many cars and why we're not using a shared system. I'm throwing that in because the budgets are coming up. So right. I'd like this as a package to look at. Okay. I just saw that and thought, hey, if there are rebates, maybe this is the time. So are there vehicles in this year's uh, requests? There are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is great. Um, and I think that's a great way to do it. Great philosophy, replacing. Can I, um, I um, because I actually am totally in agreement with what you said about just tying in those three areas right now during budget season. So I kind of don't want to be the person to hold it up, but maybe you could forward to me and I can read on my own time. Um, just um, had a, I want to educate myself on municipal commercial type vehicles that are hybrid for municipal use. Um, for example, I'm thinking of particularly um, direct department, right? And they have a couple of 16 passenger vans, same ones that I rode when I was in six, um, sixth grade. Right. Um, and a couple of, of buses that are a little bigger. Mm -hmm. um, now they're actually being used more. I was really happy to see it used as a shuttle for Earth Day. It was actually used the whole day. Um, you know, um, and we actually had the capacity to, I'm just, you know, if, if, if possible, um, to have a charging station where they're all already parked at the community center or, I don't know, that just, yep. but um, um, I know that, that it's used every single day, but short distances. Mm -hmm. It goes to AMD, it goes to Brookside. Um, it brings seniors on trips to the movies in White Plains. I mean, it's not, you know, um, so we may not even, I guess I don't know the difference between, because if we're saying that we could possibly get vehicles that are regular retail, personal vehicles, do we even need to get commercial type vehicles if we're not doing commercial type work? You don't have to answer that, right. but I, that, I that's just saying. for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sure. Um, I will say that um, a lot of the analysis that's done on the cost benefit of buying an EV is the federal tax break that you get, which we don't get, which is $7,500. Yeah, it's like the same with the solar, right? We already we get a discount, so that. it doesn't do anything for us. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but yeah, that's great. Okay. Thanks. We'll, we'll definitely do that. All right, so Can next. I ask a question separate from this? Oh, There's sure. some couple that just moved into the village that I met at Market Square uh -huh. three weeks ago. I sent, I, oh. I asked him to call you. He's moved from California, and his business is actually, I have to look at my notes. I met so many people that day. His business is commercial because commercial is not efficient yet. They're like, there's right. a real lag. They're not ready yet. And, it's, and for first responders, it's, I, I, I would not feel good recommending it, maybe in a decade. But he is uh, representing a company. It's a private industry, exactly for municipalities, um, for school buses and first responder units. It's worth an education. I, I've got to find the name. Okay, I asked yeah, him to contact you directly and to contact the supervisor uh, Levenberg as well. Mm -hmm. He was very confused as to who does what. So you know, 
Um, yeah. He may have called her, but okay. um, just to keep your eyes on that, I think it's still early, but one never knows, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else on clean vehicles? It'd be interesting to know what the town's experience has been because they purchased one a couple of years ago for their uh, building inspector. The Nissan Leaf they took yeah. from New Rochelle. Yeah. The New Rochelle bought eight Nissan Leafs last year. Okay. And I mean, and they are looking town at a has... bus too. Uh, is that right? An electric bus. Wow. Mm -hmm. The town, right? The town is yeah. for the seniors. For the seniors. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. So okay. Right. Hey. Okay. Leaf blower legislation. I'm happy to turn this over to <laughs> Corporation Council Kahan. Hi, Stuart. Thank you, Manager. <laughs> uh, it's so quiet today. Well, folks, <laughs> you got to let me know what you want to do with this one, because uh, uh, I know we wanted to potentially have another. Could, we've continued the public hearing to the 7th of November. The last time we had a discussion about uh, when the ordinance would be would come into effect, I think there was some discussion. I had suggested a May 31st, 2019 inception date. I think. Uh, Trustee Common, you were possibly looking about even pushing that potentially further back. Uh, we do have a, uh, a sunset date of January 1st, 2021 for uh, properties that are less than one half acre in size. So uh, I want to have, I don't want to put the inception date too far out that it basically starts bumping up against and we're going to basically clo close it off. Uh, I, based upon my recollections of our last discussion, I don't think there was too much else there as, as I did mention we had gotten uh, a letter from uh, the folks at Green Osning uh, the one thing I did not mention last time was that they had asked for an exemption for cemeteries uh, which would go again to sort of municipally owned properties we do not have that within our our proposal here we do it as an acreage limitation but not a limitation otherwise but it would uh, cover all the cemeteries uh, the way we the way we did it, well, yeah, unless the cemetery is more than a half acre, which, uh, uh, which was yeah. most all I mean, if they, if, if all so, so, it, so they would not, so it would not sunset out for them and they would be, uh, I'm saying. Able, so that's right. Same, it's essentially the same idea. Right, that's but correct. done differently. Right. Uh, Green Ostning had also uh, mentioned uh, an exemption for impervious surfaces. Uh, that does not, and uh, I understand what, what they're concerned about is, uh, as they mentioned, that members of the landscaping industry are required to remove landscaping chemicals which fall onto impervious surfaces. So they had a suggestion about allowing the gas-powered leaf blowers to operate at half speed on impervious surfaces to blow off those particular chemicals. Uh, that's not in the proposed local law here. I did not see that in any other local law in terms of operating this equipment at a, uh, at a lower speed on particular uh, on, on, on particular types of, uh, of, of property, particularly uh, uh, impervious surfaces. So what I have, as I said, is just to push the effective date to, to May 31, but otherwise the, uh, the proposed Local Law 7 was uh, similar to what I had uh, and what we had discussed before at the prior two public hearings uh, and, uh, you know, at the next public hearing. Uh, so I'm open to any other suggestions that the board may have. Just so it's understood, if there are other changes to be made, uh, we would have to basically notice a new public hearing because this would be different than the than the, than the previously noticed local law. Uh, but uh, I'm open to you know any any suggestions or changes that you folks uh, think may be warranted or or should uh, 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 require further discussion. What was the purpose of the uh, sunset date? Uh, that was something that was uh, suggested initially by uh, Trustee Levin, and that would basically be that for any property that is less than one half acre in size, as of January 1, 2021, gas powered leaf blowers will be prohibited on all such properties. Okay. That was the sunset. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Permanent ban okay. from that gotcha. date. Okay. For the smaller, densely okay. populated, whatever. Um, oh, sorry. Year round? Remember how we wrote. Yeah, that's, that's yes, that was affected. That it's that that indefinitely, would, right? Isn't that what? Yeah, it is? that was for those properties as of one one twenty one. They would not be permitted to use Just gas powered leaf blows. Most of the village. That's correct. Yeah, correct. We would be one of the few municipalities with an outright ban 
uh, with regard to uh, gas-powered leaf blowers. Uh, there are other places that have it, uh, but uh, given the nature of many of our properties, which are fairly small, I think that's w where this came in, but that would be an effective, that would be a ban for uh, any property less than one half acre, uh, effective 1121. People two years. To that would that yeah. Uh, That's given us two years to educate them, right? I mean, and to enforce. I mean, because like it's really up to us, right? I mean. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it would give them, for example, give them two years, uh, potentially to get different equipment if they needed to get different equipment, or at least to learn what they would have to do. They are for, until you get to one one twenty one. They still are under the uh, time constraints where we have, which is that. You can only use them between March 1st and June 1st and September 15th and December 15th. So those, that, 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 those two windows will still be there for prior to 1121 for property less than one half acre. That leads me to my perfect segue to my two questions that I have. Um, since it's budget season, are we budgeting for the replacement of all our gas power to electric? Well, we wouldn't because much of our property is not under half an acre. Right. We it wouldn't. It's under half an acre. How many parks do we have under half an acre? I don't know. I mean, I just bring it up because, you know, originally I, I kind of, you know, wanted us to kind of, you know, if we are doing this because we believe all the impacts and all the effects and all the all the benefits of the regulation of it and the ultimate ban of it, that we should also do it too. Um, so that was kind of, because if that's the case, then I have to like kind of step back a little because if we don't, I, I can't, we have to live by the same rules, I believe, especially when it comes to this. Um, and, 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 and I know we would, we would. I know we would. In, <laughs> we would in, in, so in, it wasn't just the pollution, that is a big part of it. It was also noise. It was in densely populated areas where actually it's not even so much landscapers who tend to, once they're told don't be here so early, won't come back so early because they don't want trouble. You know, they're running a business. It's from complaints of people who live in more densely populated where a neighbor uses it to clean off a sidewalk from three pebbles and leaves and, and the noise that it creates and the stuff that happens to the pets that are sitting right next to it or the kids in the, in, who are on a swing right next to it because they are a little bit more densely populated. Um, and those areas tend not to have as many landscapers, frankly. So it, it's, it's also an issue of noise and an issue of pollution and, and what goes into your lungs and all that. It's a combination of things. It didn't just start out as environmental. It also came from people who actually complained about neighbors and what they're doing and an ability to say to your neighbor it is now against the law and I'm calling the police will not stop 100% of the people it absolutely never does let us not get ourselves would it stop more than 50% of those the ability to go to your name and say uh, I think it will will it stop 60 or 70 maybe and that's not bad even without ever calling the police but the ability to say you're not allowed to do that yeah. right and that's, uh, I mean, just to bring it back to where it came from, um, I was wincing just a little bit because maybe I've been thinking about it so long that all of a sudden giving people two years to switch over, everything somehow doesn't seem as long as it did when we started this conversation. So I was sort of like been a proponent of this, but hearing it played back to me now, I'm going, wow, we've been talking about it this long, but now 2021 doesn't seem, because what we did learn from the vendors, and this is um, the truth, and we did speak, we said we were going to, and we did, um, and, and we met with them, is that the technology is simply not there. And there is, yes, the theory, and I think the mayor brought up that says, well, when municipalities force the issue, then the industry will do the stuff. You know, I'm not sure. It's, I'm sorry? They adapt. They adapt. You know, from my perspective, the technology in cars took well over two decades. Um, to adapt, by the way, and it wasn't until Obama actually said, here's the emission levels and meet it, that everybody then fell into step. So both sides, just giving you like a little, just bookending the conversation. Everybody talks about the environment, but I do want to remind people that it's not just about the environment. There were other issues about neighbors and neighbors, and that was where, and actually the only two letters I got since we're still open were about people from neighborhoods where they're on small plots of land and are 
wanting this to pass immediately. <laughs> so if the sunset date is, I don't know what about the sunset. Oh. I don't know where the board is <coughs> at with the concern of the sunset date, but if we just modify that, we wouldn't have to go into a whole different public hearing. We could just. You could just modify the date if you okay. thought that that was so, appropriate. Is that what you're suggesting, yeah. maybe? So, so. To give it more time. I mean, I don't. I don't know if anyone else shares her concern. Does anyone else share the concern about the sunset date? That it should be sooner? That it should be later. Later, because I'm oh, hearing later. it now. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I just wasn't sure. Right now, we're just giving people two years, um, and it is primarily homeowners, people in, yeah. in much of the village who have a gas-powered leaf blower now, um, and we are, by giving the state, we're hoping that their technology is going to be at a place where it is um, high-powered enough to be worth their effort and affordable enough for them to be able to transition to that. Um, and two years does seem rather short. We have been discussing it for over a year, so that may I mean, be I why the date's the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I yeah. said. I'm like, oh, yes. what? Yeah, I, I, I guess, um, and I'm so supportive of this, by the way, just um, that I've been a little bombarded the past um, three weeks, mainly from members of our Latino community that um, um, whether this is not, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but um, that despite it being dis you know discussed a year, it, it you know they feel that it hasn't really been discussed with particular communities or people, and um, I kind of felt bad because I was like you know am I not reaching particular people about particular issues? And um, I was going to forward you guys the comments that I mentioned at the meeting last time, but now we're up to a thread of like 180, which a lot of them are repeats. So I'm going to say like 50 of them. So and for whatever reason, we're not getting them here, but they're valid concerns and valid questions. So um, I just. Um, are, am I not doing a good job at explaining the law? Um, I know, Rika, you do all the time. Um, I just, um, a lot of people feel that it's going to impact their bottom line. Keep in mind, I totally agree that it has to be, be um, um, it's, it's a regulation that's needed. It's not really optional in my eyes. It's needed. Uh, health impacts, um, qual quality of life. Um, my other concern was I don't understand the time stamped photos. So, um, the enforcement piece of it, so how you oh. actually enforce. So, like, are we going to actually like have a police detail that has special, legitimate, standardized, legalized cameras that allow there to be timestamp photos? If Victoria does it on her own lawn, does her phone count with her time? Like, how does that when it when it comes to enforcement? No, like, I, I believe just like any other um, regulation, it has to be witnessed. Right. Which makes it difficult to, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because one of the questions I asked the chief that I have not followed up on since last week is um, what has he heard from any other departments? And he was aware of one community where there was a complaint that, um, or a concern that the police department feels that they spend half their time just chasing around um, landscapers with leaf blowers because they keep getting called in. I don't know the um, extent, I don't know what community it is, I didn't follow up with the chief, but I would like to know. and, and it, it exists in 14 or 15 other communities, uh, and for the most part, we haven't heard um, that it, that the enforcement is the challenge. But if there is at least one community where that is apparently the case, then I'd like to understand that better because we will be, they will get called in to do some enforcement for sure. So, yeah. so instead of 121, it's 122. No, you mean? Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Give it one, one more year. One, I want you two years. Yeah. yeah. Another year. I give it two more years. What twenty three? You're going for one one twenty three. It's gonna be great. People Wait, start negotiating. <laughs> Rewind. The public hearing is open until November seventh. That is correct. If we want it, re to well, it's 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 reopen. It's it's on for November seventh to continue. That's right. correct. Can we just still keep it open to the seventh, um, as it is, right? As it is. Um, but is there a way that we can get like a one pager info sheet? Uh, I mean, I mean, we had some people from the community in in that area of work speak to us, but not a, not representative of a lot of people that do it on their own or as sole proprietors. Or um, and um, I really feel that um, certain people and certain groups are gonna view that the board's trying to impede their way of making money and providing for their family. When in reality, it's really a protection for our residents and for them and for our community. And I just wanna um, whether it's um, yeah, I just don't think that we, 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 and by we, I mean myself also, had done an effective job at reaching out to um, So everyone. you're looking for a way, a better way to um, make sure that 
we're reaching out to the community and the community knows the the law that is being proposed and that we're likely to vote on soon yeah. uh, that seems to be the direction that we're going yeah. in um the if we create the one sheeter how are we going to what's how is that going to be a helpful tool in reaching people because social media seems to be how we've reached more people than not i mean we, we did it at we uh had a big board at the Earth Day Festival. That's a self-selecting group that are showing up at the Earth Day Festival. Correct. We've talked about it at public Correct. meetings. Yeah. Um, and I know, I know can... that um, uh, Vinny DeSisto at, um, Austin, at Austin Lawnmower has um, tried to talk to his customers about it because, you know, that's obviously a place where a lot of landscapers and landscape business owners yeah. um, go to. So there, and, and that's he's been a, a helpful um, connection to uh, industry leaders, which is how we have gotten the information that we have about sort of where we are with the uh, the potential for commercial use of um, electric options. Um, and we know it's a little bit disappointing and not exactly where we would like it to be. Um, so it, there has been a lot of efforts, and so uh, yeah, and, I'm not and, I'm not opposed I, to putting together a one sheet. I, I by no means did not want to. I by no means did not want to demean any efforts. By the way, so please, I just want to make that very clear. I I, um, I think we all agree. Yeah. We would like to do a better job at having people know about it. It's just if we create the one sheet, how what are we going to do with it to, yeah. to get it into? I mean, I can only think of what a post on Austin Padre Hispano, um, mm -hmm. maybe some bilingual sheets at Neighbors Link. Um, this is just. Two places that are popping out of my head right now. I will at the tell meeting. you though that in Austin, well, for like two months, they had flyers in Spanish, um, and he actually did speak because I told him I don't really want just his opinion. So when I walked in there, it's on my way to work. Um, Who had flyers? Oh, at Austin uh, Lawn, because he had it in Spanish. He had it sitting there, and he was handing things out um, to get the landscapers who come in because you know to get a. You know, a he's view a go-to guy in Austin. Yeah. I know. Um, but I'm just saying it's um, what was on the flyer like he, he produced it yeah he was explaining about like that there's a changeover and he's he's the one that said look here's the cost of all this and by the way let me show you the batteries and they're not efficient I mean you know I understand the environmental and I get all that but the technology's not there and we're back to what John and I were just saying which is sometimes you pass a law then they make sure the technology follows if they want to stay in business it's a, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg so we're back to what Quantel is saying, which is, I, I'm back to you, I understand. <laughs> like, you know, so we've been talking about it. We're not going to solve the electric battery issue. We're not going to, you know, we know that it affects people's jobs. We know that it costs people money to change over this, the leaf blowers and the equipment. And we know that they use it for other things. They clean up, they're, and we know that we have elderly people who use landscapers not because they're rich, but they use them because they physically are not able to do the, I mean, we've talked about the pieces, and now I think we're down to timing, which is what Quintel's going for, um, keeping it open, timing that we can still change, right? Mm -hmm. Um, giving people more time to change over and where that this is something that people can live with. I mean, I'm just summing yeah. up what we're saying for I have months no, now. I have no issue, like, because with, with a, with a one-pager, and if the one-pager can yeah, it's fine. shout out. I don't even know if it's too yeah. late for that. I just, I've been bombarded a lot. Yeah, listen. Um, and so, so, and it's all in Spanish, so I have to read it. We don't have to vote on it. We don't yeah. have, like, a date certain by when we have to vote on it. Right. So if, if we want to take the, yeah, you yeah. know, through Christmas to do outreach, we can. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to force that. We like can change that. We, 60, we're talking about within 62 days after the end of the okay, public hearing. Okay, but that's hearing. enough time for you. Okay. There's not enough time for you? Well, the public hearing yeah, is still well, open, Yeah, well, for us, right? I mean, I'm not going right, to do it for the whole the village and board. Okay, but yeah, so for us. 62 days from when we close the public hearing. So the public hearing, at least at this point, is open. So is the village creating that one pager? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to proposed policy or legislation, it should solely be created by the village. Okay. Um, because it goes into policy and enforcement, and, and then intent. we can all push it out in, in yeah. as many opportunities. Uh, any other? Well, are you going to do a one pager of a legal? I mean, share. He could do it in one page. He would probably. Well, the ordinance is one page. Yeah, there you, you go. You can. You can get that. Yeah, you know, so there you the, go. It's one page. I think you just you just do a bullet. Okay. Yeah, bullet points. Yeah, FAQs like, or yeah. 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 And not yeah. This all right. So you're going to put it online. Yeah. yeah. And, and, That puts this at the reorg agenda. In oh, if we waited for 62 days from uh, November 7th, that's fine. We, we we obviously wouldn't want to do it at the reorg, but we haven't closed it yet, and we yeah, could exactly. do it. Yeah, exactly. You could close the. You could wait till we could, later we could, yeah, in November we, to close the hearing. You, you get yeah. plenty of time if we, for that. If, but that's good to know because if we want to time our window 
from the time we close the hearing to the time we vote on it to make sure you have time for outreach, that's good to keep in mind. And my last question, now that I know that we're not fully kind of exempt, but we're not, but um, even with how the law is set up, um, does that mean that in public property where we normally use gas-powered leaf blowers that are under that amount would stop? I mean, I, I could list places right now. I mean, that's why I'm bringing it up. There, we use it. I, I think I don't, I don't think so. I, I, when I think of village-owned property, so we are. If, if, if it would so it mean, doesn't apply to us. Yeah, yeah. Like if, if, in my mind, if it's village-owned property, if we own. So I live on Main Street, for example. Ten acres. So we or... we maintain all the sidewalks from around the um, bank building, and then we stop at the church. We also do the aqueduct um, by Church Street. We also do the aqueduct by um, Open Door. That is all done depending, and if anyone's out there in DPW, you know, DPW. Um, the majority of the time when it's not a lot of, you know, um, it's all cleaned up using gas powered leaf blowers. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how we're, how it's we're measuring that. It's more than a half acre. Yeah, that's more you than know. half an acre. It's big open space. That, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, like the half acre, um, uh, which is in some communities, not in all communities, in, in some pieces of legislation. No, 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 no. I, I, but, you know, that, that, that whole impervious surface thing, like when we talk about like cleaning up after the village fair. Main Street's way bigger than a half an acre. Yeah. So it's there's it, another reason. So we're not we're not exempt because we're the municipality yeah. because we we, we we do recognize the importance of following which is which is the same reason why we we didn't treat ourselves as if we were exempt when we went through the whole town planning board process for the Indian Park Water Treatment Facility yeah. where we treated ourselves just like we were any other applicant so that there was a full public hearing. So um, whether so, we're required yeah. to or not, I don't think we have any properties under a half acre. Maybe a firehouse? Oh, there would be per property, though, is it? Yeah. It's the property. It's per property, so, right? I mean, even yeah. if we There's, had But I don't one. think we really have any. I mean, maybe one of the firehouses. I don't know. There might be one or two. But by the way, we would follow the same rules. There's a sunset day of when we would switch over like other people would if we decide to do that. And, and by the way, you know, the reason there's a half an acre is there's an issue with electric power and how far you can go before it really becomes useless and if you look at these things. And it's around the half an hour. I mean, there's a reason for it. There's a, but I think we're following the same rules. I mean, you don't think we should, but I mean, aren't we following the same rules? Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know. I'm just concerned because, like, you know. I don't, I, I think the way that the legislation is written is that just by default, we hmm. would be using gas power. It's a moot point. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that's what. Yeah, it is a moot point. Yeah, that's the, what I think. The bigger question is, as the gas-powered leaf, as the electric leaf blowers become uh, strong enough to be a viable option for commercial use, when do we, with the same mindset we had to when we replace vehicles, let's consider having an electric vehicle, when we replace equipment and the equipment is up to the standard that it could function to us for us, um, then we have a commitment to replacing the environmentally yeah. super loud leaf blowers of the past with the new ones when they're up to the standards that are going to do the job. And I think that should be a village policy. It's not something we could legislate, but it is. Agreed. I just wanted to make a point, and, and I get it. Um, we're not there yet, especially, you know. Um, we and we it. will, and I know that. Yeah. Um, but my only point is that, you know, my neighbor who just had a baby and my senior citizen who's, a, you know, um, their quality of life just won't matter because, they're, because they chose to live there. Um, that's all. Um, they can't complain, um, you know. I, you know, they can't report it. Do, but do they live in? Do they live in a property that's less than a half acre? Yes, yeah, so even even where I live on Main Street. I mean, they're, they're used all the time by the village. Um, but because we're, you know, we, I can't really call. Not that I plan to, but someone can't call the police department. The village is cleaning around the bank building, or the village is cleaning by the, you know. And downtown's a pretty heavy residential area, right? So um, that's why I brought it up because the quality of life part, which is such a big part of this whole. Law and you know, in the first place. So, yeah, but again, it follows the same rule as everybody else. So it's not because they happen to live there that they get treated differently. It's everybody is treated actually exactly the same. So, you know, it actually I think is better written than some others that do exclude themselves from this policy. Um, and what is happening? I mean, it's it's actually probably more egalitarian in that sense. Um, I only look at you, Stuart, because you spent so much time researching all the villages and towns in upstate New York and 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 cities and etc. So very egalitarian, actually, in that sense. 
And if the technology does get better, then why wouldn't we change over whether the law says we have to or not? Why would we not try to do that? This is a very environmentally uh, friendly community. If the technology is there, we'll do it. So, Quantel, what do you want to be as the year? Uh, so, yes, thank you. Thank you. I mean, you started it. Yes. So, what was uh, so what was I don't have a problem with 1 one twenty two. The mayor has suggested one one twenty three. Um, so twenty three or twenty two. Wait, hold up, hold up. So I'm actually so I just if we know that we're not able to do our complying with how it's written, especially because we are a municipality that covers a lot of ground, and because the technology is not where it's at. Wouldn't that be the same notion for a small business? But we don't know. We're giving it time to say it's a. They're working. Are you talking on about it. the dates? Are you talking about the lot size? What's your question? Lot about? size and and just the actual the machinery. So like, if if it's not up to par for us to replace our entire fleet right now, yeah, we're not expecting. But that we're not doing that. Well. We're in, right, not until. Right. That's why I, you know. and, and, and the, that's just, no, no, I'm just time, I'm thinking actually, out loud here. And, that's and, all. and at the time, uh, when we get to that point, if three years from now, what, whoever is on this board, they may say, yeah, not not ready yet. The industry hasn't gotten together, and then yeah. they can change. Or the other way, or they may say the there's been a breakthrough in the technology, and yeah, yeah they'd probably still want to give people time to be able to save up their money to buy yeah. the new one. But see, I want to communicate that that you know the whole sunset thing and that you know that we're really trying to get out seeing what, where it goes i think that will really help people understand so you prefer it better to go out farther so you prefer 23? 23 23, 23. Yeah, yeah back to what you were saying yeah you, like you could always do it sooner but yeah it, so we've got two for 23 we got two for 23. <laughs> oh oh okay. hi john I, I get to say something here okay here we go um no, I, it's earlier? fine. Listen, this is, we could, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we've just been working this pretty hard here. So um, I, I think the, the provision, I think the most powerful part of the provision is that we're saying that, that during certain parts of the year, these, these, this equipment is not being used at all. You know, I mean, we're basically saying that, that notwithstanding, leaf blowers shall be used only during the following periods, March 1st to June 1st and September 15th to December 15th. So. The most powerful part of this is that hopefully if if we can actually enforce it there'll be less pollution going into the air six months of the year right isn't that that's kind of the idea here right that that for a large portion of the year that we're not going to be polluting the air and and that's a powerful statement and and i, I think that's what's most, most important about this i also think that um as far as the date's concerned uh, I, you know 22 23 i could go with either one whoever the majority i don't really just, just, just pick one. If you pick one, we'll, we'll, we'll just. You want to make me no more happy? I don't even like, know where we use that. I mean, I, I just, you know, I mean. Just give me one. Twenty-two or twenty-three. Twenty-three. All right, there we go. All right, thank you, John. See, Rika didn't even have to say anything. <laughs> All right, so then we're asking Stuart to change two dates from the version that has been the current draft. One of them is uh, for when the partial ban begins at all next year which would be a may date right and then the other is the sunset for the uh any any leaf blowers on any less than half acre at all needs cannot be gas power leaf blowers correct after january 1st 2023 so yes. we're extending that by two years okay so this this no. one this would require a new public hearing correct no no that that saying not, those, not, those not, changes are minor enough change that we don't you, have you to don't do a new oh. public hearing but oh, we have a public hearing open on November 7th, and we may or may not choose to close it at that time because we, we, uh, if we want to do some more outreach to the public. We want to give ourselves a little bit more of a cushion of time to be able to do that, do a one sheet in English and in Spanish, highlighting some of the key points here. And um, uh, the village will create the sheet and push it out, and all of us will help push it out and reach out to folks. OK, sound good? We're skipping snow. Um, I'm moving on to a uh, cabaret application for Malike Turkish Cuisine. Thank you. We have a, a cabaret license, a completed license application from the Maliki Turkish Cuisine. Uh, it has been uh, uh, checked off by both police and the building department. Uh, what they are looking to do is uh, on Friday and Saturday evenings 
and they have it, and, and I've checked this out with them, just between the, just between about 7.30 and they say 7.45, let's say 7.30 and 8, uh, they're going to have a solo belly dancer with recorded music. Uh, and it's only once. So in other words, I was concerned that it would be multiple times. Uh, Mr. Murphy, who is the proprietor, wrote back and said, no, it's just once, it's for the family, that's it. And so what they're looking to do is just do that. Again, it's Friday, Saturday nights for that sh very short window. Uh, and uh, a dancer with uh, recorded music. Uh, as and I said, otherwise it's gone through the police, it's gone through the building department, uh, and everything was found to be fine. So uh, since this is a uh, not a one-day cabaret license, but a full-time cabaret license, uh, it would require a, a BOT approval through a resolution. I just ask one question. <laughs> Were you yeah, asking? Uh, well, you know, I'll ask. Mm -hmm. um, they could use it outside if they wanted to, the uh, patio, which also seats as part of the restaurant. They, they have not applied for no, a so, sidewalk okay. cafe license. No, no, I mean. No, no, they have no, a back. They have a the deck. patio on the back. They have a deck. Uh, presumably. Is that part of their, well, their liquor then site? Then presumably, if it's, yeah. on, it's presumably, it, it, it would apply back there. It's not clear where they're going to be doing the music. I mean, the state liquor authority would have to, it would have to be part of their. Because I should say this, the floor plan that they the floor plan that they have attached is an interior floor plan. All right. Okay. Um, so, is the is the application just going to be asking for that very tiny well, we window have days a few days a week? Our application asks for requested days of the week and hours of operation of the cabaret. They wrote in Friday, Saturday, p.m., 7.30 to 7.45. All right. No, okay. no. <laughs> John, I understand. I, I, wrote, to the, I wrote to the proprietor because I thought Do they I understand they're asking for 15 minutes? Specifically or? wrote back to me. I, I can find the email here. He said they're just doing it once at that time. And my suggestion is that we obviously give him like an hour. <laughs> oh, we give him. Oh, no, no. We give, give him what we give to everybody yeah. else. We're bringing a guitarist on or, Thursdays. Or, or, or yeah, she's late. Yeah. You want to like, yeah. this is a crazy. private party. You want to hire yeah. someone? Yeah. yeah. This is not a one day. Because it's not one. No, no, one day would be only if he was doing it for one day. What He'd standard? Seven to ten? Every Friday and Saturday nights. Every Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah, it's much. It can't go to like two in the morning. He's not open. It's for a half hour. You know, like. Oh, that's right. Give him anything, you know. Okay, I just feel like. Give him the standard, and I think we'll be Can you give someone what they didn't ask for? Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> no, seriously, are we allowed to say yes if they didn't have like, While we're doing like, this, like, permitting it. Do it. All we will be yes, doing we can. is permitting it. I'm just going to just, just to read you his response. Okay, this was from today. <laughs> I had wrote, I'm reviewing your application. You indicate you will have a solo belly dancer with recorded music for a 15-minute performance beginning at 7.30 p.m. How late will there be performances? Response. Just one to begin with, starting at 7 p.m. This with. is just a short family-friendly show that will always be early evenings only. So, in any event, to begin with, it gives us license. John, that, yeah. Okay. So, so he he's not thinking about the bigger picture here. Okay. So, so we'll I, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we need to create like a standard template that says if you apply for this, it's from X hours to X Wait. hours. On these, on this days of the week, and X hours on the weekends, or whatever. But, but you know, they're going to find out that maybe they want to do two shows a night, and it's going to go past the. They have is, to come back to us again. We'll give him. I think the board, my, the resolution would essentially give him what we have given other locations yes, for a, a weekend, a Saturday, Sunday. I mean, I think that's. He's asking the, for that's Friday, the, Saturday, Friday, right? Friday, Saturday. I'm sorry. Friday Friday, but I think we usually do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Uh, I mean, typically, don't we? Yeah, we have we have a lot of flexibility. I mean, some people are very specific, but you know, like yeah, time frame, right? Our concern. We I, want I, to encourage businesses to have the options. Hours and we'll give him the hours, and you know what? I, I think the board can give him the hours, and if he works within those hours, it's fine. I mean, you know, it's. it's what if he wants to do belly dancing minutes, on Sunday? I mean, uh, like they close by like ten o'clock. Yeah. I know I'm not worried about the late. It's just if they want to do something on a Thursday or yeah. Sunday, well, I don't. I, there's no reason to restrict them. They're not no, getting a yeah. discount. I, I'm just saying. Well, he, he <laughs> answered. <laughs> the, that was, I was about going to say that. He answered the question that's some, in our application. You know, group to sing on a Thursday okay. evening. Yeah, I want them count. to do it. Yeah. We'll do the. Re we'll do Tell one. Him we've decided that we, we somehow we're giving we're giving him more than well on him. <laughs> <laughs> Big government. Big government giving you more options. Want to keep discussing this? Okay. The resolution. We are agreeing on this. Let's move it in. The resolution so, will be on for November you, the 7th. And um, the reason snow is not on here is because um, 
Stuart never wanted it to be on here. There's some miscommunication. So I said, so why is snow on here? Yeah, so uh, I, we don't I, have a snow I update. Do we have a snow code, code, code update? No. I, I mean, I know what it's about, but we can put it on for another time. All it's right. really, don't worry about it. Okay. And okay. um, we do need to do executive session. Uh, Dr. Barney? Uh, we have three things. Uh, collective bargaining and um, public safety. Okay. Okie dokie. Public safety? That's a justification for uh, is that what I call exec? It? Yes, to be, to be precise, it's to uh, uh, potential imperiling of public safety. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion to move to executive session for matters of collective bargaining and public safety. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Next week is Halloween. So we will not have a village board meeting. We look forward to seeing you either at Market Square or at your front door all dressed up. It'll be so much fun. Um, and then we will be at uh, the Birds All Vegan Police Court facility on November 7th. And it is a very special meeting because we will get to see the proposed manager's 2019 budget. Woohoo! It's, um, we'll it's also Diwali. It is. Yes, you're right. Festival of Lights. Lovely. Um, speaking of lights, we've, spoke, we've spoken a lot we're about lights tonight. On, and we're both on the same calendar. <laughs> uh, it's in my government calendar. On November 7th, we're not going to necessarily have discussion about the, the budget. Usually, like, we actually get handed it, and it is the first time that any of us, besides Debbie and the finance office, are going to see it. Um, I assume that within 15 hours, it'll be up on the website for the public to be able to see? Yeah. Yeah, so as soon as we get it, like the next morning you come in and you put it on the website and the public then has a week to look at it before the public That's hearing. Right. Yes. Okay. And then when we have the public hearing the following week, which is November 14th, before the public um, gives their comments, Debbie's going to give us a presentation of, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of uh, really deconstructing the, the budget and putting it in terms that is much more accessible for the public to understand more than just a, you know, 100 pages of line items. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening. This meeting is adjourned to executive session.